and there's some preliminary is called to order. Uh, in order to provide our technical and digital staff with notice of the hearing start, I'm going to count down from five before calling the hearing to order. So let's do it all over again. Five, four, three, Two and one, the hearing is once again called to order. The Subcommittee on Energy and the Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change will, for the third time, now come to order, just in case any of you might have missed it uh, earlier. Today, the subcommittee is holding, subcommittees rather, are holding a hearing entitled Keeping Us Safe and Secure Oversight of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. New to the COVID 19 public health emergency, members can participate in today's hearing either in person or remotely via online video conferencing. Members who are not vaccinated and participating in person must wear a mask and be socially distanced. So such members may remove their masks when they are under recognition and speaking from a microphone. Staff and press who are not vaccinated and present in the committee room must wear a mask at all times and be socially distanced. For members participating remotely, your microphone will be, uh, be set on mute for the purpose of eliminating inadvertent, inadvertent background noise. Members participating remotely will need to unmute your microphone each time you wish to speak. Please note that once you unmute your microphones, anything that is said in WebEx will be heard uh, over uh, the loudspeakers in the committee room, and uh, they will be something to be heard by live stream and by the ever present omnis uh, uh, omniscient C-SPAN. Since members are participating from different locations at today's hearing, all recognition of members, such as for questions, will be in the order of full committee seniority. Documents for the record can be sent to Lino Pina Martinez and the email address we provided to staff. All documents will be entered into the record uh, at the conclusion of today's hearing. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Today, the subcommittee on energy and the subcommittee on environment and climate change convened for a joint oversight hearing with a focus on maintaining the safety and security of our nation's nuclear power facilities and nuclear materials. Uh, the committee will uh, gavel, uh, will recess moment for a moment. 
Stand your reason.
committee will now resume and come uh, reconvene. The group committee is now uh, reestablished, and the committee will now be called to order once again. Uh, let me repeat that our recess was caused by technical difficulties and that were expressed by uh, not only the chair, but also various other members of the subcommittees and the House Recording Studio has now resolved those issues. So we will proceed again. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes uh, for the remaining four minutes, four minutes, 21. For five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Once again, good morning. Today, the subcommittee on energy and the subcommittee on environment and climate change convenes for a joint hearing, uh, an oversight hearing with a focus on maintaining the safety and security of our nation's nuclear power facilities and nuclear materials. For this important topic, it is indeed a pleasure to have Chairman Christopher Hansen, Commissioner Jeff Marin, and Commissioner David Wright of the NRC before us today. Chairman Hansen, let me first of all uh, take a moment to congratulate you on recently becoming the 18th chairman of the NRC. Since the NRC's establishment near the Energy Reorganization Act of 1974, it has fostered uh, the protection of public health through the licensing and regulation of the civilian, 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 civilian use of radioactive material applications. Further, it is promoting the protection of the environment and the security of nuclear activities through nuclear waste evaluation and international agreements. The NRC's continued leadership is essential for these reasons and many, many more. For example, the NRC has a key role in the licensing and regulation of the commercial nuclear power industry, which is a major source of uh, low carbon electricity. The generation of electricity from carbon free and low carbon energy sources like uh, nuclear energy is critical in the face of uh, the ever present climate change. At present, nuclear power is the world's second largest source of low carbon electricity, just behind uh, hydroelectric uh, power. In the United States alone, uh, last year, over 407 million metric tons of carbon dioxide pollution were imported through nuclear power plants. Despite the decommissioning and closure of plants like those in my home state of Illinois. In light of these facts, nuclear power facilities and the low carbon electricity that they produce are valuable tools as we work to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, which reduce climate change, inducing greenhouse gas pollution. In addition, the review of developing nuclear technologies like small modular reactors and advanced reactors is also equally important. Taking this all into account, we must make sizable investment in the oversight of nuclear facilities and materials to ensure their safety and security. That's why I am pleased to see the NRC's FY22 budget uh, request 
which recommends a budget increase of $43.4 million above the FY 2021 enacted level. In addition to this, it is important that the IRC conducts this oversight with deliberate consideration of these of those populations that have historically borne the brunt of persistent environmental health disparities, which is caused by energy production and other environmental hazards. In this vein, I applaud the NRC's leadership for directing staff to review how environmental justice is addressed through the agency's programs, policies, and activities. Today, I look forward to a progress report on this directive and any related findings. And with that, I yield to my friend and colleague from the great station, great state rather, of Michigan, our eminent ranking member, ranking member Upton, for five minutes. You're now recognized. Well, thank you, my friend, Chairman. And this is one of those days where you could, even though this hearing is on Zoom, you could actually be just a few miles uh, south of me in the in the great county of Berrien County uh, in southwest Michigan as we're not too far apart. You know, it's been a, a couple of years since we've heard directly from the commission. And for the two of you, Chairman Hansen and Commissioner Wright, this is the first time before the committee as commissioners. So want to make sure that we have the welcome mat out for you. And welcome back, Commissioner Barron. As a former committee staffer, you understand our long interest in effective nuclear policies. So today's hearing offers the chance to hear how the NRC is right-sizing and adopting to changing industry dynamics and technologies and improving its own performance. The hearing should allow us to discuss your approach to regulating. It should allow us to hear an update on the agency's budget, its work to implement new statutory directives, and its work to transform itself to meet these future challenges. The NRC's focus on assuring adequate safety of radiological materials serves as a, a key role in shaping our nuclear future. And its mission to provide reasonable assurance of safety and security is critical, for sure, to building the public trust in nuclear technologies. I've seen the good results of the NRC's work. There are three nuclear power reactors in my district, two at DC Cook Nuclear Power, just about 10 miles south of where I am right now, and one at the Palisades plant, just about 10 miles to the north. All of the men and women at these sites, the engineers, electricians, professional security workforce, help provide clean electricity for thousands, tens of thousands of Michigan's households. Their dedication to their work and at the positive impacts on the surrounding communities is commendable for sure. And they've shown the community value of nuclear power and demonstrated safe, productive operations. When you consider the amazing benefits of clean, reliable nuclear power, when you think about the quality of work, the pride in the communities that nuclear produces, it is disheartening to watch what is happening to the nation's operating fleet. Yes, there are now only 93 reactors, down from 104 a decade ago, with several more to close soon, including Palisades just to my north. Electricity market structures, renewable tax subsidies, abundant natural gas, reliable, stable energy demand produced unprecedented economic impacts on nuclear power generation. The negative effects of this are happening and even impacting the NRC, just as a new class of advanced reactors is emerging on the horizon. So these are challenging times, and the NRC has got to meet them. Shortly before our last hearing with the commission, the NRC's Executive Director of Operations initiated a transformational effort, building on other recent reforms that are led to ongoing work to improve its performance. And by the end of 2018, the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act also was enacted into the law, which required the NRC fee reforms and a steady push for the development of a new advanced reactor regulatory framework. I'd like to know how these efforts are playing out and what do you think that the end result ought to look like? Uh, what we want is a nimble agency that ensures its procedures don't become impediments to a robust industry in our energy and national security interests. 
During my time as full committee chair, we dealt with some contentious NRC regulatory issues and would focus on NRC's principles of good regulation to guide our oversight. These principles remain as clear a guide as ever for what ought to be expected of the agency as it develops policies to assure safety. And I would remind you that these were bipartisan. We can talk about what these mean during the hearing, but I think it's crucial that the agency under your leadership focuses on these principles as you update management and regulatory activities that's gonna benefit all taxpayers, ratepayers, licensees, and the public. I look forward to the discussion and I yield back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Tomko, the chairman of the subcommittee on environment and climate change for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Am I audible? Can you hear me, Bobby? Uh, no, chairman. I can't. Yeah, I hear you now. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rush, for leading today's hearing. It's a pleasure to co-host with you. And welcome to Chairman Hansen and Commissioner Wright, and a special welcome back to Commissioner Barry. We always appreciate your taking time from your important work to update the committee on the NRC's budget request and issues that come before the uh, commission. I'll start by echoing Chairman Rush's comments about the importance of nuclear power, which accounts for one half of our carbon free electricity. Nuclear is an important, clean part of our energy mix. But as we know, many facilities face economic challenges. Several have closed prematurely in recent years, and several more are planned to close in the 2020s. We also know the reality that some portion of these plants' power will not be replaced with carbon-free electricity. And even if it were to be, new clean megawatt hours brought online will backfill those lost clean electrons rather than increasing our overall supply of zero emissions resources. So for the sake of our urgent climate needs, it is indeed critical that existing reactors continue to operate through the end of their licenses. I support several potential federal policies that would enable that to happen by recognizing the positive environmental attributes of nuclear energy. I also think that the federal government can help realize new potential revenue streams for these facilities, such as the production of clean hydrogen through proper incentives, such as demonstration projects and loan guarantees. But of course, first and foremost, these reactors must continue to operate safely. In May, I was able to visit the Beaver Valley Power Station in Pennsylvania. I met with the facility's management, security officials, and IBEW workforce. I was also fortunate enough to be able to spend time with the site's two NRC resident inspectors. It was clear that the NRC staff are dedicated public servants that care about safety, not only because they are consummate professionals, but because they and their families live in the very communities that these facilities operate. Now, I have the utmost respect for the work of the NRC staff, and I want to ensure the commission has the resources necessary to keep these on-site inspectors in place. Over the past 16 months, we have learned a lot about the nature of work and how much can be done remotely, including even congressional business. But safety and security inspectors, uh, inspections at nuclear facilities cannot be uh, conducted over Zooms. So I do hope that NRC inspectors are able to get back to work safely and that the commission does not pursue actions that would reduce inspections or seek to substitute remote monitoring for in-person inspections and security tests. And while safe operations are the top priority, I know members are interested in learning about other proceedings before the commission including uh, advanced reactors, environmental justice, and decommissioning. We also know the commission, along with DOE and Congress, 
has a role to play in addressing our nation's waste challenges. A long-term solution for existing spent fuel, not to mention potential waste from new advanced reactors, will certainly be critical to the long-term viability of nuclear power in this country. I want to thank the commissioners again for joining us today and for their commitment to um, nuclear energy. I look forward to hearing your testimony about issues before the commission, and I do hope that we can work together to ensure safe and secure nuclear energy continues to play a role in our nation's effort to reduce air pollution and achieve science-based climate targets. With that, I thank you, Chair Rush, and I yield back. And the chairman of the energy of the uh, environment. On the environment and climate change, my friend from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look, there's a fundamental question that I think we need to address, and that is, is Congress trying to address climate change? It can be achieved by reducing carbon emissions, or is it using this debate as an opportunity to eliminate nuclear and fossil fuels? Right. So if, if the left wants to address climate change, and we should be embracing nuclear power and carbon capture, but, but on nuclear power, Senator Sand, Bernie Sanders has said it's a false solution. In 2019, Elizabeth Warren said she hopes to phase out nuclear power by 2035. Phase it out. Uh, the Sierra Club says it's unequivocally opposed to nuclear energy. Greenpeace calls nuclear power dirty, dangerous, and expensive. And, he, and last month, Biden's hand-picked Environmental Justice Council concluded in its report that it's unalterably opposed to nuclear energy. So I know people will say one thing, but I want to make sure Congress is doing the right thing. It's, it's clear to me that the left in Congress wants to eliminate nuclear power and replace it with wind and solar. But, but what are the consequences of that, of transitioning to 100% by 2030 or 2035? Let me do the math for you. To replace a typical 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plant with wind turbines and battery backup, we would require 1,430 windmills, wind turbines would need to be installed. And then according to the, uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which says that windmills require two tenths of a square mile of land on average across the country. So do the math. That's the equivalent of 286 square miles 286 square miles, roughly the size of the land mass of New York City. And, and, and also for Frank Pallone, uh, that's, that's still larger, almost 50% larger than his entire congressional district. And this is just for one of 94 existing nuclear power plants, let, let alone adding in the fossil fuel power plants that would have to be replaced with land mass. So according to this, this much land, to acquire that, by 2030 or 2035, we're, Congress or, or the utilities and the states would have to have use eminent domain. And then that would cause extensive litigation. So, so the idea of trying to achieve it by 2035 is simply not feasible. And on top of the landmass grant, if the U.S. did transition to 100 percent renewables by 2030, 2035, it's, we've already had testimony, Mr. Chairman, of course, utility bills are going to go up. Thousands of jobs would disappear. The global CO2 uh, levels would still be a dangerous level, uh, above 350 parts per million, according to John Kerry. And America would still experience extreme weather events like hurricanes on the East Coast, wildfires, droughts, and, and flooding. Uh, uh, so, so if, but if the objective is to reduce carbon emissions, we should be promoting nuclear energy and investing in carbon capture. But in order to have a serious conversation about that, about the climate change, the left needs to be honest with the American people about its true motive. Are we trying to reduce carbon emissions or are we trying to eliminate nuclear and fossil fuels? Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time.
German U.S. Bank. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush. Today, the committee continues its longstanding tradition of conducting oversight of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and I want to welcome new NRC Chairman Christopher Hansen, Commissioner Jeff Barron, and former Energy and Commerce staffer and Commissioner David Wright. Thank you for joining us today. Nuclear power has a role to play in our efforts to tackle the climate crisis. Last year, the power sector accounted for nearly a third of total U.S. carbon dioxide emissions. Studies show that to achieve 100% decarbonization affordably, we need reliable carbon-free resources that can sustain output for long periods of time. Now, my home state of New Jersey has three operational nuclear power reactors at the sale on the Hope Creek, Hope Creek plants in the southern part of our state. The state is also home to the Oyster Creek nuclear plant, which ceased operations in 2018 and is now in the decommissioning process. NRC's oversight of operating reactors and those in the decommissioning process is critical to the health and safety of those in surrounding communities. One issue that is important to my state and many others that, that are home to these shuttered nuclear power plants is NRC's proposed decommissioning rulemaking. As more nuclear plants retire, the decommissioning process must work for all stakeholders. And this rule has been in the works since 2018, but I remain seriously concerned with several aspects of it. I believe the rule provides an insufficient role for local communities to participate in the decommissioning process. Further, the lack of official NRC approval or disapproval of a plan's decommissioning plan is both puzzling and disturbing. I also have concerns with proposed changes of the Commission's reactor oversight process, the program that oversees safety and security of our nation's nuclear power plants. I'm particularly troubled by proposals that would arbitrarily reduce core safety inspections and reduce the importance in public reporting of so-called white findings, which are safety or security issues of moderate significance. Conducting fewer safety inspections at nuclear plants, even at the plants with the best safety records, could lead to safety and security gaps that are ultimately missed by nuclear regulators. And multiple white findings at a plant can also point to larger systematic safety or security issues, and therefore we should not underestimate the importance of analyzing these factors. The nuclear industry frequently touts its safety successes over the past decades, but that success is partly due to the efforts of federal regulators to stay on top of inspections and safety protocols of plants across the country. Making nuclear power more cost competitive by weakening NRC safety oversight, I think is dangerous and ultimately self-defeating. Now, last week, NRC announced it would begin to review how the commission's programs and policies address environmental justice. Underserved communities and communities of color have disproportionately faced the negative effects of energy generation and climate change. And I welcome the NRC's environmental justice review, and I hope it leads to greater consideration and inclusion of the views of these marginalized communities. We must also find a solution to address our nation's need to safety store, safely store and dispose of spent nuclear fuel. Last year, President Trump drove a stake through the heart of the Yucca Mountain Project when he reversed his support for the project and eliminated its funding. And I continue to believe interim storage is the best near-term solution to stop the nuclear waste stalemate and maintain our commitment to communities and ratepayers. The NRC is critical to ensuring a safe and reliable U.S. nuclear energy sector. I look forward to your testimony today as we discuss the path forward, and I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The Chairman yields back. The Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Ms. McMorris Rogers, for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Good morning, everyone. From clean, re reliable power generation to industrial uses to medical diagnostics and treatment, nu nuclear technologies are helping America win the future. These benefits extend worldwide, thanks to the long established American leadership. 67 years ago, Congress enacted the essential policies that continue to guide safe nuclear development for here at home and that we export abroad. The Atomic Energy Act sought to encourage the widespread use of atomic energy for peaceful purposes, 
consistent with ensuring our common defense and our public health and safety. With that policy, we led the world for decades in the development of civilian nuclear technologies. It also set the standard for safety and security that continues to this day. The world we are confronting today, however, presents new challenges to our technological leadership. For nuclear power generation, there are international challenges, notably from China and other nation states that are working to dominate emerging nuclear markets. There are domestic economic challenges. Certain federal and state policies undermine the economic vitality of nuclear reactors in some regions, even if they are necessary to provide reliable, clean, zero emission power. This in turn threatens long-term American nuclear competitiveness and strategic interest. It risks loss of our nuclear industrial base, future innovation, innovation and workers with operational know-how. Not to mention the harmful consequences in communities when nuclear plants shut down. To be sure, these nuclear policy issues hover outside the purview, some of these energy policies hover outside the purview of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's mission as an independent safety regulator. In keeping the Atomic Energy Act goals, the agency should operate in ways that do not add to the challenges. As the NRC chairman, Chris Hansen himself noted in March in a speech that he gave, quote, the NRC must do its best not to be an impediment to innovation and deployment. I agree with that. A key question for this hearing concerns how this agency plans to unleash innovation going forward. Will it update its regulations to account for the best available data and operational experience? Will it establish predictable, clear regulations appropriate to the risk of the technologies it licenses? To address future climate risk, to strengthen our global competitiveness and security, beat China, and win the future of nuclear, there is an urgent need to deploy innovative new technologies. There's a lot to be excited about. The Pacific Northwest alone hosts a number of advanced nuclear companies working toward demonstrating and licensing. NRC actions in the next few years will be critical for these companies. Oregon-based New Scale Power Small Nuclear Reactor, it's a modular reactor, has just reached the last step to finalize NRC's design certification. TerraPower's Natrium and X Energy's XE100, both are collaborating with Energy Northwest to develop projects for demonstration. The safety attributes of these small nuclear technologies promise a range of new deployment opportunities. X Energy also is seeking to certify triso fuels, which promise additional safety benefits. To fully capture these economic, innovative, and climate benefit benefits, the NRC must be prepared to renew, license, and regulate these technologies in a timely and efficient manner. Fortunately, the NRC has been working toward this goal, and it possesses a wealth of information for smart regulations that meet the safety mission appropriately. Former Commissioner Annie Caputo noted recently that the, 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 the nuclear industry has more than 4,500 combined years of operational experience with generating nuclear power. Because of the lessons of this experience, the U.S. nuclear fleet is operating at the highest levels of performance and safety in its history. In 2019 and 2020, the industry produced record levels of power with fewer operating plants. Performance like this is achieved through safe operations, and this experience should continue to inform NRC as it seeks to improve how it performs its mission. I look forward to this discussion today, and with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, everyone. The ranking member for the full committee yields back. Uh, it is now the time uh, for our witnesses' uh, testimony, their statements, and I'd like to once again welcome our witnesses for today's hearing. Uh, our witnesses are the Honorable Christopher T. Hansen, the Chairman of the NRC, the Honorable Jeff Marin, Commissioner of the NRC, the Honorable David A. Wright, Commissioner of the NRC, 
I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. We look forward to your testimony. Uh, Chairman Hanson, you are now recognized for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Chairman Rush, thank you very, very much uh, for that introduction. And Chairman Pallone and Chairman Tonko, ranking members McMorris, Rogers, Upton, and McKinley, and distinguished members of the subcommittees. Commissioner Barron, Commissioner Wright, and I appreciate the opportunity to update you on the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission's licensing and oversight activities, as well as the fiscal year 2022 budget request. The NRC is an independent federal agency established to protect the public health and safety through the regulation of commercial nuclear power plants, research, test, and training reactors, nuclear fuel cycle facilities, and civilian use of nuclear materials. Additionally, the agency regulates transportation, storage, disposal, and export and import of nuclear materials and waste, and the export and import of nuclear reactors and production facilities, and the export of nuclear facility components. The past year has been one of change and innovation for the agency. In response to the Department of Health and Human Services declaration of the COVID-19 public health emergency, the NRC took several steps to protect the safety of our workforce while continuing to perform our important safety and security mission. To ensure that the agency could remain agile and responsive in its regulatory oversight role during the pandemic, the NRC implemented a number of interim processes and procedures. In addition, the agency was able to remain committed to public service and engagement despite limitations of in-person meetings due to the public health emergency. Most of our public meetings held over the last 15 months have taken full advantage of communications technology and effectively reached broad audiences. In short, while the public health emergency posed some challenges, the NRC has remained committed to its regulatory oversight role and steadfast in adhering to its mission. In March, the NRC issued annual performance letters to the operators of the nation's 93 operating commercial nuclear reactors. 89 reactors reached the highest performance category and fully met our safety and security performance objectives. Only four reactors were in the second and third performance categories, needing additional inspection and oversight. There were no reactors in the fourth performance category, and all continue to operate safely. Since December 2019, the NRC renewed reactor licenses for three nuclear power plants for a period of uh, from 60 to 80 years and is currently reviewing two more applications for subsequent license renewal while performing an acceptance review of another. The staff is also preparing for completion of construction and anticipated transition to operations of the two Vogel reactor units in Georgia, subject to the agency's regulatory approval process. Inspections are proceeding in accordance with the licensee's continued work at the site. Further, the agency is hard at work developing the new 10 CFR Part 53, which will define a technology-inclusive, performance-based requirements for advanced nuclear reactors. We anticipate publication of the final rule in October 2024, well ahead of the schedule required by the Nuclear Innovation and Modernization Act. Working closely with our international counterparts, the NRC regularly engages in a wide range of bilateral and multilateral activities that enhance the safety and security of nuclear activities worldwide. With all this work going on at the agency, we understand the importance of having a highly skilled and committed workforce with the expertise needed to carry out its duties now and in the future. To this end, the agency is engaging in strategic workforce planning for the future and prioritizing an open, inclusive, and collaborative work environment where members of our workforce feel comfortable raising questions or concerns without fear of reprisal or retaliation. Finally, the NRC's FY22 budget request is $887.7 million, including 2,879 full-time equivalent employees. When compared to the FY21 enacted budget and authorized carryover, this represents an increase of 24.4 million, primarily to support salaries, benefits, and awards adjustments. The budget request reflects the funds needed for important future and ongoing work at the agency. For example, it includes 23 million for the continued development of a, of a regulatory infrastructure for advanced reactor technologies. 
In closing, the NRC remains deeply committed to protecting public health and safety and the environment, as well as ensuring the long-term safety and security of nuclear power facilities and nuclear materials. We are closely monitoring the changing environment, tackling new challenges, and taking new approaches to address the issues that confront us. Chairman Pallone, Chairman Rush, and Chairman Tonko, ranking members McMorris Rogers, Upton McKinley, and distinguished members of the subcommittees, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to appear before you today, uh, and we look forward to taking any questions that you might have. Thank you so very much. The chair now recognizes Commissioner Marin for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. It's great to be back with my colleagues to discuss NRC's important work. I want to take a few minutes to focus on three pressing challenges affecting NRC, the fight against climate change, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and the pursuit of environmental justice. Policymakers and the public are increasingly focused on climate change and on dramatically reducing carbon emissions. The urgency and scale of the climate challenge have led to a public debate about the available emission reduction technologies and the role of nuclear power. Obviously, NRC is not charged with setting broad energy policy. We don't get involved in decisions about electricity market design, carbon pricing, or electricity generation portfolios. Our focus is on ensuring the safety and security of whatever amount of nuclear power is used. But I think it's clear that meeting ambitious climate goals will involve nuclear power. I see NRC's nexus to climate change in two main areas, the operating fleet and new reactors. For the long-term operation of existing nuclear power plants, NRC's role is to provide strong safety and security standards and rigorous independent oversight. In recent years, there has been a counterproductive emphasis on reducing inspections, cutting costs, and creating ever more restrictive constraints on agency action. In my view, we need to refocus on safety and the basic value of oversight. Instead of contemplating reductions in the frequency or number of vital safety and security inspections, we need to pursue changes that will improve NRC oversight, not weaken it. The reactor oversight process has generally been an effective safety framework. If we're going to make a particular change, there should be a solid safety case for the change. We should not adjust safety standards or oversight based mainly on cost considerations. This program affects every operating reactor in the country, and we need to firmly focus on the safety and security impacts of our decisions. Of course, NRC needs to be open to and ready for new technologies that could improve safety, whether it's digital instrumentation and control, accident-tolerant fuels, sensors, advanced manufacturing techniques, or artificial intelligence. We need to establish a reliable regulatory framework for reviewing these technologies while ensuring that they are adopted safely without introducing any unacceptable risks. The other main climate-related role for NRC is the licensing and oversight of new reactors. Right now, our main goal is to establish the right regulatory framework for the review and safe operation of new technologies such as advanced reactors. NRC's current power reactor regulations were written for light water reactors, which make up the entire existing fleet. It makes sense to update those requirements to address different technologies. New reactor designs have the potential to be safer than existing designs. The challenge is striking a reasonable balance between taking into account the value of new safety attributes and maintaining a prudent degree of defense in depth. Some elements of NRC's existing regulations for large light water reactors won't be appropriate for non-light water reactors. Other requirements reflect enduring defense in depth principles that should apply to advanced reactors, such as the need for appropriate emergency planning and siting. This is especially true for new technologies with little or no operating experience. As Chairman Hansen noted, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic has been another major priority for the agency. To continue our work, the agency has largely been operating virtually with almost all the headquarters and regional staff teleworking. Fortunately, we've had the IT in place to carry on effectively. The toughest balance for NRC to strike has been on inspections. For the first few months of the pandemic, we were conducting very few in-person safety and security inspections, and resident inspection, inspectors were on site far less than usual. The resident inspectors are now getting back on site more frequently, and the regions are getting back to in-person team safety and security inspections. I think it's a very positive development that the staff has set a goal of getting back to normal levels of oversight this year. During the pandemic, some inspections were performed remotely out of necessity. I see that as a temporary measure that made sense during an extremely unusual and challenging public health emergency. As we move into the new normal in the coming months, I think there is broad agreement on the value of and need for in-person safety and security inspections. 
There's no substitute for having independent NRC inspectors on site. NRC must also pursue environmental justice. We must meet the moment and be ambitious. We cannot settle for doing things the way they've always been done. We need to ask tough questions about our programs and procedures to understand if they are serving disadvantaged communities or instead creating barriers for them to overcome. I'm excited that the commission unanimously tasked the staff with performing a systematic review of whether environmental justice is appropriately considered and addressed in the agency's programs, policies, and activities. My expectation is that the staff will consult with a broad range of stakeholders and develop recommendations to improve how the agency pursues environmental justice. Our goal should be to achieve significant, tangible results. We have a lot of work ahead of us, but I'm confident that NRC will do its part to tackle these challenges. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. The Chair, thanks the Commissioner. Uh, the Chair now recognizes Commissioner Wright for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, thank you, Chairman Rush. Um, and if I could, before I begin, I'd just like to clarify the record maybe really quick um, uh, and really thank you for the warm welcome, but I'm, I can't uh, for a minute take credit for uh, the work of Commissioner Barron before this committee uh, when he worked here, I think, under uh, Chairman Waxman. So uh, it was he that worked for the committee, not me. Uh, so I just wanted to make that clarification if I could. So with that, good morning, uh, Chairman Rush and Chairman Tonko and ranking members Upton and McKinley and esteemed members of the subcommittees. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And it's wonderful to be here in person too. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking my colleagues, my staff and the NRC staff for their assistance in getting ready for this hearing. I'm honored to serve alongside my fellow commissioners and I appreciate their collegiality and uh, insights on each of the matters that come before the commission. It's bittersweet though to be here today with only three of us now. Um, we work best with the full complement of Commissioners, and although it's only been a couple of weeks since Commissioner Caputo uh, departed, I know we are missing out on the additional perspectives uh, and wisdom two additional commissioners would bring to our deliberative process. I'd also like to thank the NRC staff for their work and dedication to the agency's critical safety mission. Uh, I'm humbled by their efforts, particularly during the past year and a half during COVID uh, and, and the pandemic. So before the pandemic, I spent considerable time walking the halls of the NRC uh, and visiting facilities. These impromptu meetings uh, and visits provided me invaluable insights into the agency's priorities, successes, and challenges. I learned that success is easy to define. Uh, it's the safe and secure operation of, of the civilian nuclear fleet. And this is a shared goal of the commission, the staff, and our licensees. The challenge now uh, is how to reach that goal in the most effective, efficient, and reliable way while dealing with uncertainties, new technologies, and changes in the regulatory environment. I believe the NRC is up to the challenge, and I'm excited by the transformational and innovative initiatives that are going on at the NRC. The staff's hard work and inclusive approach is inspiring to me. I'm also pleased to see the work we are doing to improve our budgeting processes in, res in response to the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act. Finally, I'm impressed with how the staff has used challenges from the pandemic to leverage technology and new ways of doing things. I see change, in particular changes to how we perform our work, as an opportunity. Change allows us uh, to use data and experience to recalibrate our activities and perform our mission uh, in a smarter uh, way, uh, more effective as a regulator, ready to regulate both existing and new technologies. So with that, I will close and thank you and I look forward to your questions. This uh, concludes our opening statements. We will now move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes uh, to ask questions of our witnesses. And I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. The commercialization of small modular and advanced nuclear reactors are indeed promising technologies that can further power our path toward a cleaner economy. However, some experts believe that the 
licensing of these technologies present regulatory challenges that may require model, <clears throat> modification to existing regulatory requirements. Chairman Hansen, in what ways will the requested FY 2022 uh, NRC budget support the agency in licensing processes or regulations for these varieties of technologies? Uh, Chairman Rush, thank you for that question. The, our FY 2022 budget request includes $23 million that is uh, off fee, that is it's uh, strictly appropriated um, from taxpayers for the development of a regulatory framework uh, for advanced reactors. One of the key elements of, of this and the, among the issues that the staff is balancing is, as you said, is ensuring that um, safety is at the heart of that regulatory framework. Also that there's some adjacency to regulatory frameworks that have come before, that is so that vendors and utilities who might come in for those applications can recognize key elements. Um, but as also part of that process, Chairman, um, we are having, we've really changed the way we're developing this regulation by having frequent and substantive interactions with all of our stakeholders early and often as part of that process to get as much feedback so that we can learn about the wide array of technologies that the agency may have to regulate and um, understanding uh, the safety aspects of those up front so that those uh, challenges, those issues, those uh, safety matters can be incorporated into that rule. And also the, so that by the time we get through this process with a draft rule in May 2022 and a final rule in 2024, that um, uh, stakeholders in the community, both public interest groups, vendors, and utilities will understand well in advance what that, uh, what that rule is made of. A small modular and advanced nuclear reactor design present an opportunity for the commercial nuclear industry to evolve in ways that would enhance uh, aforementioned safety and increase efficiency. Chairman Hansen again, how should NRC regulations and licensing process uh, take the evolution of small, modular, and advanced nuclear reaction, reaction designs into consideration? Uh, yeah, thank you again uh, for that, Chairman Rush. We really are looking at each of the technologies um, that both the size components uh, where we're evaluating what's known as the source term, that is the, um, the constituents of, of, uh, of radioactivity that could be released in an accident scenario, <laughs> also looking at the uh, other aspects of advanced reactors such as the fact that some of them operate at atmospheric pressure, um, that uh, they use unique uh, coolants or moderators to um, control the nuclear uh, reaction. Um, uh, as well as other kind of ancillary uh, technologies that may be um, uh, bolted onto these reactors, such as molten salt batteries or hydrogen production or other kinds of things. And we're really kind of taking all of that into consideration to understand um, the safety aspects and the risks so that we can make a, uh, a determination. So we can create, first of all, a regulatory framework that ultimately allows us to make a determination about the safety of these technologies. This year, the NRC directed commission staff to systematically review how environmental justice is addressed in its program, policies, and activities. Chairman Hanson and Commissioner Barron, will you provide the subcommittee with a brief update of the NRC's environmental justice review? Uh Happily, uh, <laughs> uh, the, as Commissioner Barron noted. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, as Commissioner Barron uh, noted. In addition. Yes, um, the, we have a, a staff uh, group that is looking at this kind of per commission direction, uh, Chairman Rush, uh, that is looking at, as we said, at taking a comprehensive review of the environmental justice issue. That group is underway. There's a charter that's been developed. We're happy to provide that to the committee that outlines their work. And I believe there are a couple of public meetings, uh, if not today, uh, then tomorrow uh, uh, on this issue to get uh, public feedback. One thing, uh, my time is, is expired. The chair now recognizes 
the chairman of the committee on uh, environment, uh, Mr. Tucker, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you again to our commissioners. Uh, we know the difficulties caused by the COVID-19 uh, public health emergency. But during this time, the NRC and licensees have, con have continued to operate reliably and safely. So, Chairman Hansen, is there anything you've learned from that from this period that uh, might help to inform how the NRC could better operate or conduct oversight of uh, of the industry moving forward? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Tonko. We're really accumulating the lessons learned from the public health emergency uh, as we speak. Um, we do have a couple of observations going forward. I think the first one um, from our resident inspectors, you mentioned um, uh, speaking with two of them at, at Beaver Valley, and, and I did so recently as well, um, that there's kind of no substitute for boots on the ground when it comes to um, uh, reactor inspection. And we were able to do a lot of that even during the public health emergency um, where we were able to safely bring on our inspectors on site. Other activities such as document reviews um, and even um, uh, online uh, plant performance data was able to be done in some cases on the plant site, but often cases um, uh, remotely, and that seemed to work fairly well. So it's that kind of balance um, where there, you know, we recognize there are some activities um, that can be done, uh, like I said, like... Um, uh, uh, reviewing plant operating data um, that can be done remotely, but we also really have a, uh, an even deeper appreciation for uh, on the, the importance of on-site activities uh, through, through the public health emergency. Thank you, Chair. And Commissioner Wright, um, what is your thinking? Are any lessons learned from NRC's pandemic response that could be carried forward? Yeah, thank you for the, uh, for the question. So there's I was really impressed with how, from day one, the uh, the NRC adapted. Um, they went completely telework almost overnight, um, and they were. I don't think that they 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 skipped a beat. You know, I was very impressed with how engaged uh, all the business lines were, all the managers, all the the residents that were that were having to perform uh, uh, at the plants as well too, and and how they went about doing their job, and and we worked very closely with the licensees on if there if there had to be exemptions given or. or this certain certain things so that we keep our people safe and and their people remain safe as well. So there's no doubt that the staff identified things that we can carry forward. Uh, you would think in, in, in something like a pandemic that you're going to learn those things and you're going to be exposed to those things. And I, I agree with Chairman Hansen that uh, boots on the ground, uh, that those, that's the best way to do things, you know. But we did learn that there is a place for technology and um, and to improve the way we do things, and I think he, he mentioned a couple. I mean, it's like the portals for exemption requests, uh, the the review of election uh, of uh, inspection documents, and, and real real time plant data is available to us. So, um, you know, we have the opportunity to do those things. So, you know, our our inspection program is based on decades of, of experience and history, and and uh, you know, I, I don't think it served us well. It's going to serve us well in the future too. But I, you know, like everything else, it's not static. Um, and it, it's always evolved over time, and it's going to continue to do so. Thank you. And Commissioner Barron, your assessment? Well, thanks, Chairman Tonko. I would, I would echo some of what you said earlier and what my colleagues just said. You know, when I have in my recent conversations with inspectors and managers, um, I hear a renewed recognition of the uh, value of in-person uh, safety and security inspections, whether it's the ability to put eyes on vital equipment, uh, talk informally, to uh, plant staff, um, observe performance firsthand, uh, and really even the intangible but very real um, benefit of having an independent inspector with an NRC hard hat walking around um, doing oversight work. Um, you know, as, as we've all said, I, I think remote inspections during this pandemic period were, uh, were a necessity, but frankly, they're just not as effective as in-person inspection. Um, and our inspectors find issues in person that they wouldn't be able to detect remotely. Well, I thank you for that. You know, uh, I know that our NRC employees are incredibly dedicated, and I believe the safety of federal employees is paramount. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to acknowledge the work that has been done over the past 16 months to continue to, uh, to ensure the safe operations of our nation's nuclear reactors. Uh, 
I had some other questions that I wanted to get into with uh, uh, in regard to waste challenges uh, from uh, our nuclear facilities and advanced reactors, uh, but I'll forward those to uh, our, our guests today. Thank you. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentleman years back, the chair sincerely apologized to the ranking member of the uh, Energy and Power uh, uh, Subcommittee for his order. Um, but it's not my honor to uh, recognize the chairman of the, the ranking member of the uh, Energy and Power Subcommittee for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, but I'm, I'm going to be a asking questions. Um, and uh, uh, again, appreciate the, the hearing uh, for sure. I want to follow up on Chairman Rush's uh, question uh, relating to the small modular uh, reactors, uh, you indicated that you expected the final regs to be completed and, and final by uh, 2024. What is the ex assuming that we're able to stay on that timeline? And it's you know a, a number of us have been talking about this for many many years, maybe even as long as a, a decade. What is your expectation if if we're able to follow through by getting those regulations done? What is your expectation as to uh, what the industry's reaction will be in terms of following up and actually looking at following through on a petition uh, to get licensed, to begin construction, and what would your timeline idea then be in terms of assuming that everything went okay, that we would actually have these small reactors online in communities uh, uh, early uh, prediction for, for uh, across the country? Ranking Member Upton, thank you for that question. Uh, you know, recognizing that the NRC's crystal ball is uh, somewhat imperfect, uh, let me try and, and take a stab at your uh, uh, answering your question here. And um, assuming that, um, uh, you know, part of the idea of these, this high level of interaction as we develop the rule is that so that industry uh, recognizes what's in the rule um, as soon as we're able to go public with that, and that the, the rule is ideally uh, usable and attractive um, to applicants that come uh, before the commission. Um, recognizing also that there are uh, certainly companies that are looking at, at um, submitting applications to us for construction and operations before this rule is actually going to be published. Uh, TerraPower is, is a good example. I think we're expecting their application in the 2023 uh, timeframe before we're we're uh, final on this. Um, uh, so assuming th that there was a company that would maybe come in after part 53 was final and published, our goal is to review um, combined operating and license applications in roughly the three and a half year uh, or 42 month uh, uh, timeline. So I think you're talking about something in the order of 2027, 2028. Uh, of course, um, applicants still have the option of applying under the old system where they could apply for both a construction and operating permit. So, um, it, you know, there's, there's going to be a variety of options uh, for folks there. But certainly, um, I would imagine, you know, assuming everything goes well, as you said, Congressman, uh, by the end of the decade. So if your forecast is, let, let's say it's rosy, it stays that way, the crystal ball looks good. How many of these we may have online by, like, uh, Pick a number, 2035. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. I think a lot of it's going to depend on the economics. Uh, as I've said in public um, many times, NRC, um, we're independent, but we don't want to be an, an impediment to uh, technological innovation in the nuclear area. We have a, a, a critical um, but uh, certainly very select role uh, in the energy ecosystem, and that is to uh, ensure uh, safety and security. Uh, of the, of these facilities, um, so I'm I'm uh, I'm not sure I'm able to say by 2035. Uh, okay, uh, how likely that is. All right, I won't, I won't hold you to it. Uh, okay. Let me ask uh, uh, another question. I, as I understand it, you grew up here in Southwest Michigan, uh, and I know that when you were born in, we had uh, the full complement of commissioners. Uh, I think all of us are a little friendly. We don't have five. 
<laughs> that are, are working hard, a lot of responsibilities. Uh, but would you agree with us that we really need to see that full complement of five uh, be confirmed and, and through the process as, as soon as we can see it happen? Uh, yes, Congressman. I think we work best when we have a, a full complement. Uh, let me say, I think we, uh, among the three of us, have a good working relationship. We're very collegial, and I think we can continue with the Commission's business, but we look forward to uh, the administration and, and the Congress acting to uh, provide us with uh, two additional colleagues. And let me just ask one final question. Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm at both of my facilities, uh, have been quite often. And I meet with uh, not only the, the operating staff and the employees, also the really talented NRC residential staff uh, that's there. Uh, I want to be sure that as, as we come through this pandemic, and we hope to finish, uh, it's my understanding that the NRC staff has, has never been away from those companies, right? They've, they've had constant 24-7 oversight at not only my two facilities in Western Michigan, but all across the country, is that not accurate? Uh, that's that is um, that is reasonably uh, accurate, uh, Congressman. I, um, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, that may have been that we were doing more document review and more mo remote monitoring of plant performance. But certainly, as we got into say the second or third month, uh, we were looking for ways for our resident inspectors to get back on site. Um, uh, you're right, uh, Congressman. I am from Southwest Michigan originally. I, in fact, I was just at D.C. Cook a, a couple of weeks ago as I was uh, preparing to visit my family before the July 4th holiday and had the pleasure of meeting with both NRC and plant staff at, at Cook and, and uh, would like just to share how impressed I was on both sides. I know my time has expired, so I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, you are now recognize Mr. McKinley for five minutes for questioning the witness. Our U.S. nuclear reactors, uh, we're down to about just 94 units across the country. Mr. McNerney's not in front of his camera, so uh, did you say McNerney or McKinley? Because I can't hear McKinley. David, is your microphone turned on? It said, no, it says it's, uh, I'm not muted. Can you hear me? Can, can anyone else hear me? Yeah, Mr. McKinley is recognized. Okay. Uh, Thank you again. Uh, so we know our plants are 94 years old uh, and, and they're, 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 their average age is 39 years old and we're down to just 30 and 94. So if we're going to reduce emissions, I don't understand why Congress is not promoting nuclear energy and incentivizing, modernizing our aging nuclear fleet. Uh, but unfortunately, it appears we're being persuaded or influenced by the fear-mongling Hollywood elite and the activists who constantly keep focusing on Fukushima and Chernobyl, Chernobyl 35 years ago, or even when they mentioned Three Mile Island that occurred 52 years ago. Well, Mr. Hansen, your Chairman Hansen, why isn't the NRC spending more time in the benefits of nuclear energy instead of promoting politically polarizing issues like environmental justice? And secondly, do you envision, can you envision the NRC denying a new nuclear power plant to go into operation because of the differences uh, around such a nebulously defined environmental justice? Can you respond to those two? Uh, yeah, um, thank you, um, Ranking Member Kinley. In our authorizing statute, the Atomic Energy Act, we have a distinctly um, non-promotional role. That is, we're strictly a safety regulator. Now, as part of that mission as a safety regulator, we have certain responsibilities for public participation, uh, particularly as it, it pertains to environmental reviews and, uh, and other issues. Um, uh, I think when it comes to issues like siting, uh, um, you know, there are issues that come into play with regard to public participation and potentially environmental justice um, uh, historically that I think could be relevant here. Um, our our uh, 
Uh, and of course, then sighting plays into the impacts of um, potential accident scenarios, which we have to take into consideration as part of making a safety determination. So I would say that's right, kind well, of how I, those things are linked together. The chair, I, or chairman, I, I, I obviously we maybe need to have more of a conversation about this because there's I, my question primarily was just, are we going to deny a, a plant based on environmental justice? So maybe we can have that conversation again later, but because of the time frame, we only have five minutes total. So uh, let, let me continue with this question is, so if the left is, is attack nuclear uh, over the issue of spent fuel rods, and currently the United States is unfortunate, we don't have a recycling uh, our nuclear waste uh, due to the high cost. But France has been recycling for years at, La, at the plant at La Hague in France. There are numbers of companies I know that are, that are tr looking at ways to reduce the cost of this, so that we don't have to bury them in Yucca Mountain. But, so Chairman Hansen, what is the position of the NRC uh, uh, in, in facilitating ways of recycling our spent fuel rods and reducing costs? What role do you have? Yeah, thank you, Ranking Member McKinley. Our, our role in, in any approach to recycling is gonna be primarily that of a safety regulator. So if the United States or private companies uh, endeavor to undertake uh, spent fuel recycling, then um, under the Atomic Energy Act, uh, that would come to us to make a, a safety determination for that. We have the, the staff and the capability uh, available uh, for such an effort um, should uh, that policy decision or that economic case uh, be made outside of our jurisdiction. But isn't it, okay, uh, I, I hear you, passing on to others uh, and it's not your responsibility, but I believe it is part of, of cost benefits ratio that we would have here for America. So what is your personal bid? Do you think, would you be encouraging recycling or spent fuel? Yeah, we're, unfortunately, Congressman, we're really not in an encouraging or kind of promotional role on this. We're really strictly the, the safety regulator I, on that kind of thing. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, do you personally feel that this could be advantageous for promoting nuclear power if we could recycle or spend fuel rods. You personally. <laughs> uh, as chairman of the NRC, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, stay strictly uh, I think with the with this in the in the safety realm uh, on this. I'm I'm very happy to discuss this and other topics um, uh, with you in in in, uh, in in any other venue you'd like, Congressman. Sorry you're being evasive, but uh, thank you for uh, being honest about it. I'm not going to answer the question. So, Mr. Chairman, go back. The chair, the, now I recognize uh, the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Malone, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush. I want to thank the commissioners again for joining us today. Uh, I mentioned the reactor oversight process, or ROP, in my opening statement. And I sent a letter to the commission in 2019 outlining concerns I have with that proposal, which is still before the commission. Reducing core safety inspections and limiting public reporting of low level safety issues of plants across the country is unnecessary in my opinion and counter to NRC's mission. So Chairman Hansen, what is the status of the ROP changes proposed by NRC staff in 2019 at this point? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Pallone. Those papers are still pending before the commission. Um, I'm not aware offhand of what the vote record is on that, but they're they're still under consideration. And then let me ask Commissioner Barron, where do you stand on these proposed uh, ROP changes, Commissioner Barron? Uh, I have I have some pretty consider significant concerns about several of the proposals. There was a a proposal to have. Um, licensee self-assessments take the place of um, independent NRC inspections. I, I have real concerns about that. I think NRC safety inspections are essential uh, and that NRC inspectors need to be independently conducting them. Um, and at this point, it's been a couple years now, I think everyone actually agrees on that. I don't know that anyone's really in favor of, of that proposal from, from a couple years ago. Uh, my understanding is that the NRC staff's actually considering withdrawing that paper. Um, that seemed to endorse that concept, uh, and I would support 
um, they're withdrawing that, that proposal, which I think was pretty flawed. There were also some proposals there to reduce the frequency of some very important inspections, inspections that looked at safety culture, inspections that looked at engineering, um, looked at the ability of licensees to identify and correct problems, which is just absolutely central to the safe operation of a plant. Um, and my understanding is that the NRC staff is looking at that too, whether it makes sense at this point um, to withdraw those proposals, and I would be supportive of them withdrawing those proposals. Well, thank you. Look, I, I frankly will say that I hope that the commission can withdraw or table these recommendations. So uh, that's my opinion, and, and uh, it, I would, you know, I would hope that that's what you would do. Frankly, um, another topic that is relevant to my state and, and others with shutdown nuclear plants is the decommissioning rulemaking. I mentioned that before too. There's a proposed rule before the commission that makes several troubling changes to that process that I wanted, but I wanted to highlight one of them in particular. States and local governments have always had very little say over the cleanup and decommissioning of nuclear power plants, and the proposed rule before the commission fails to properly expand the role of states and local governments in this process, uh, which I think has generational impacts on these communities. So I'm concerned about this, and it's something that impacts many states and towns. So let me ask Chairman Hansen, can you commit to taking a long, hard look at this as the commission proceeds on this proposed rule with an eye towards giving communities a more meaningful role in the decommissioning process, if you will? Yeah, uh, Chairman Blown, I'm happy to take a very close look at this. I understand um, the importance of this uh, for local communities and uh, uh, how directly uh, it affects them, both for plants undergoing decommissioning and those uh, facing the prospect of, of shutdown and decommissioning in the future. Well, I appreciate that, and I hope improvements can be made to better incorporate these voices into the process, so thank you. Last question, quickly. Uh, the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act that Congress passed in 2019 and included a cap on the Commission's corporate support spending or overhead costs that include information technology, agency cybersecurity, and facility upgrades. I'm concerned that this arbitrary cap is causing the Commission to forego or delay necessary investments in these areas. Is this corporate support cap, I guess I'll ask the Chairman again, is this corporate support cap leading to delays in important investments that would have otherwise occurred sooner prior to the institution of the cap? Uh, actually, anybody can respond uh, if you would, but let, let me start with the with the Chairman. Yeah, thank you, um, yeah. Chairman Plone. We've been able to meet the corporate support caps uh, to date, but uh, as you know, um, I think in, in 2022, that's at 30%. In 2023, it goes down to 29%, and then it declines uh, thereafter. And it becomes each percentage point amounts to somewhere between eight and $10 million in reduced costs for our corporate support. At a time when I think we're trying to make investments in IT modernization, there are some indications, and we're looking more closely at this, that our IT costs are going to be going up. Um, and that we need to make uh, investments in IT in order to more better risk inform some of our regulations and modernize our regulatory processes. We need to invest in our people in order to make them, uh, to get them prepared for advanced reactor licensing. Um, and, and we need to invest a little bit in our physical space, which hasn't been updated in some place of 20 to 25 years. So we've been able to meet these caps so far, but it's going to be uh, a very significant challenge, I think, going forward, and I'm very concerned about it. Well, let me just say thank you. I think that the Congress needs to look at reforming this corporate support cap to give the Commission more flexibility for these needed investments. But my time is expiring. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rush. <clears throat> Chair, I don't recognize this ranking member of the full committee, Ms. McMorris Rogers, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When it comes to addressing our clean energy goals, our energy and national security interests, nuclear technologies are essential. And, and many have been speaking to that this morning. And there's, a, there's promising advances on the horizon, really exciting, innovative new, new fuels, small reactor technologies that have the promise to revitalize the benefits of nuclear for all of us. And they promise to ensure a more reliable power, a more flexible deployment, which can provide new ways to reduce industrial emissions, all while building up American prosperity and our ability to compete and share our American know-how with the rest of the world. That's what American innovation is all about. And that's why we're working so hard to identify what it takes 
to remove the unnecessary barriers to deploying these new technologies. There are several pieces of legislation that my colleagues and I have uh, introduced, are co-sponsoring, that seek to ensure the NRC performs its safety mission without impeding innovation and deployment. Two years ago, Congress required the NRC to implement a risk-informed regulatory framework for advanced reactors. So I, I wanted to start by asking each one of you, uh, beginning with Chairman Hansen, can you describe what risk-informed means in, when it comes to practice and why you believe it is important for NRC licensing of new reactors? Uh, thank you, um, Congresswoman McMorris Rogers. Um, to me, uh, risk informing our regulations uh, means using the incredible body of experience that the NRC and frankly our licensees have developed over the last 40 or 50 or 60 years in the use of nuclear technology to inform uh, our efforts going forward so that we can focus on the most safety significant aspects of any new technology. So that we do have some experience in this country with advanced reactors. We had built some of them in the 50s and 60s and 70s. A lot of the technologies that we're seeing come back around, rely on some of those learnings, and we are, as an agency and as an industry, I believe, kind of excavating some of that information uh, to apply to these new technologies. Also, um, I can say that we're also um, learning from the significant operating experience of the light water reactor fleet and understanding what's important for safety uh, uh, in this new regulatory framework. With that, I'll, I'll let my colleagues respond. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Well, I think Chairman Hansen said it very well. I don't know that I have too much to add, but I would just point out, um, you know, this big advanced reactor rulemaking we're doing right now, it's a major effort, uh, and it's challenging because you want something that's risk-informed, that's performance-based, that's technology-neutral. You need to have something that works for molten salt reactors and high-temperature gas-cooled reactors. You need something that works for micro-reactors and reactors that could be several hundred megawatts. It's, it's a tough challenge. And you're asking a question that is one of the core things that comes up in these stakeholder meetings, which is what should it mean to be risk-informed? And some of the stakeholders, some of the vendors, think it should really be tightly um, focused on probabilistic risk assessment, those, those, those uh, numerical models. Others want to have more flexibility in how they would present their safety case. Maybe they would say, well, our, our reactor is inherently safe for the following reasons with these materials or this structure. And so that, that's, um, that's not a purely academic question. It actually goes right to the heart of the efforts underway to do this rulemaking. Thank you. Mr. Wright? Thank you very much. So I thought about this a little bit. And so in order to be um, in the best position to continue meeting our important safety and security mission, uh, as you know, the NRC embarked on a transformation journey uh, to help the agency keep pace with uh, the highly dynamic and interconnected environment which we operate. And we've got to be prepared to regulate an industry that is innovative and has new technologies. And as an agency, we, we have to recognize and understand that every, everything we do, either uh, personally or professionally, carries some degree of risk. Our mission, as you know, is to provide reasonable assurance of adequate protection of the public health and safety and promote common defense and security and to protect the public. Reasonable assurance acknowledges that there's a risk element. So being a modern risk-informed regulator means we've got to be able to use data, uh, historical and operational experience, other lessons learned uh, in, in, in a way to reevaluate the way we conduct business, recalibrate and streamline our processes and procedures and maximize efficiencies to better serve the American public. So, I mean, that could include a lot of things, right? You, we, we have the, the law NECA, uh, which there's a possible cost sharing, you know, but, but again, DOE's the promoter, they're the salesman, we are the safety regulators, but that does not mean we cannot work together um, and work with with the members of Congress in order to, you know, if y'all decide you want to identify that particular technology, we've got to be prepared to, to regulate it and, and to provide a pathway. So regulatory certainty is another thing that we've got to provide as well. So um, Thank you. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Well, yes, yeah, so my time has expired. I think it's important just to note that we really have the gold standard in the United States of America, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that we are uh, taking uh, the expertise that we have into consideration. Thank you. I yield back. The ranking member yields back. The chair now recognizes 
the chairman of the subcom uh, O and I subcommittee, and generally from Colorado, Mr. Nugget, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you and Mr. Tonko for having this important hearing. The first thing I want to say is. I get really frustrated when my colleagues on the other side of the aisle demagogue this issue for partisan purposes, because in fact, many of us recognize that nuclear energy can be an important bridge fuel towards energy independence and towards reducing carbon. And that's why I'm working on a renewable energy uh, bill that ha that's source neutral and could include nuclear energy. And frankly, uh, Mr. McKinley and my other colleagues on the other side of the aisle, they know that because we've talked to them about this bill. But the purpose of this agency, the NRC, is to make sure that as we develop nuclear energy, we do it in a safe and and um, and a protective way. And I, I want to appreciate the efforts of the agency to do that. And so I have a couple of questions to that end. Uh, now, now um, the United States has a wonderful record, uh, safety record with nuclear power. But a couple of years ago, I led a group and we went to the Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan. And, and they also thought that they had a uh, really strong protective system at that plant. And of course, in the tsunami, it breached the plant and they are still 10 years later having issues with water contamination. Earlier this spring, they announced that they're going to start uh, releasing radioactive contaminated water into the ocean. And they're still grappling with how they can control the terrible breach that happened at Fukushima. And so I wanna ask you, Chairman Hansen, 10 years out from this accident, what lessons have the NRC and the U.S. nuclear industry learned about the tragedy and acted upon to ensure the safety of our nuclear facilities? Uh, thank you for that question, Congresswoman uh, Deget. Uh, in short, I think both the NRC and the industry have learned quite a lot uh, in the last 10 years. We have, I can provide uh, you some details on that for the record. We convened um, what was known as the near-term task force within the NRC. We sent a delegation to Japan to uh, learn firsthand um, about the accident, about the pre you know the precursors and the other issues uh, associated with um, the regulatory scheme in Japan, so that we could take those back, uh, so that we could learn, but also then to help our our Japanese uh, counterparts uh, move forward and operate. Um, uh, more safely so can, can in the you future. Can you briefly tell me some of the things you learned? I appreciate that you went over there. What were some of the things you learned? Um, I can. Um, we we made uh, each of our plants uh, conduct an extensive uh, reevaluation of the hazards uh, facing them. So flooding and seismic primary, primarily among them, but also just generally all external hazards. And we really learned a lot from that. We were able to deploy equipment centrally in the United States in Memphis and in Arizona um, to be deployed in the event of an emergency. Um, we had a number of other um, uh, requirements, including um, uh, installation of, of hardened containment vents, um, and also uh, spent fuel uh, pool monitoring equipment. Um, uh, so I think there were a number of things. Uh, my colleagues were uh, here for that. I don't know if they want to respond. Yeah, let, let me ask Commissioner Baird, do you think we need further steps to prevent any kind of catastrophe in our nuclear system? Well, you know, as I, I think there is a gap that we still have. And um, with the rule that was the post Fukushima, that rule that was finalized in 2019, provides for additional pumps, generators, hoses at nuclear uh, power plants in case of emergency. It's a very good step. And I think there's broad agreement that this flex equipment, as it's called, is the single biggest uh, post-Fukushima safety improvement at nuclear power plants. But there is something that's missing, which is that uh, when we finalized that rule in 2019, we did not require it. We did not require that flex equipment to be protected from the up-to-date flooding and seismic risk. So we spent all this time, years and years, getting the latest data on what are the latest flooding risks, what are the latest seismic risks. In the end, um, the rule didn't go as far as it should have. It did not require that that vital equipment is protected from those risks. And, um, you know, with the changing climate, flooding risks are not static. 
uh, it makes no sense to allow uh, licensees to operate with obsolete flood hazard estimates that are in some cases decades old. So I do think that is something we should think about revisiting going forward in terms of preparing the plants for the impacts of climate change and just the reality of what we currently know about those hazards at the plants. Thank you so much. I'll look forward to working with you on those issues and I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Generally, you met the chair that recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Murgis, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Commissioner Wright, let me just ask you, uh, you heard the responses of the other two commissioners on lessons learned from Fukushima and, and preparedness. Would, would you care to, to have a, a statement added to that? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. So uh, to follow up on Commissioner Hansen, uh, you know, the, the NRC completed all the uh, near-term Fukushima task force um, related reviews in September 2020, and, and they confirmed that all sites have adequate capabilities, either existing or voluntarily added. Uh, to cope with all the beyond design basis um, uh, reevaluated hazards. You know, the commission approach um, in our final rule that we, we worked on in 2019, I mean, it retains the flex equipment that is already in place um, at every operating plant in the U.S. It allows for a case-by-case -case, uh, determination about further enhancements to the plant or to the flex equipment, and it's risk-informed, it's performance-based, it provides licensees the flexibility to address site-specific uh, hazards um, and, and other configurations that are specific to that plant. Um, you know, because it, one in the, the plant that's in the Midwest is not gonna be the same as on the coast. Um, so it reflects lessons learned since uh, the proposed rule was issued uh, way back and it's proven effective uh, in, in maintaining uh, safety. And in fact, um, everything that they tried to do was done through the 5054F letters, uh, which were in addition to what the rule was talking about, the things that we did to harden everything else, was two years earlier than what the rule would have required. Let me just ask you a question. Do you feel as if the plant operators are empowered to make safety decisions uh, real time, or do they have to consult with someone at the commission? So I, I would think that it, because they communicate and we've got inspectors on site, right? We've got two inspectors on site every day. Um, so those conversations can take place. If they think that they've got to make a modification based on new hazard information, flood in data, or whatever, it, uh, they, they can make those decisions. But if it's something that they think that has to get NRC approval, there's a way to do that. Sure. Let me just uh, ask you, here we are, I hope, on the backside of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, <clears throat> we've all talked about lessons learned to the extent that your agency has been a learning agency during this time, or there, uh, and, and this may be a longer question that you want to respond in writing, but are there things that we've learned along the way that uh, I hope we've been a learning legislative body during this time too? Can't say that that's been 100% the case, but I, I, would be, I would be interested in your thoughts. And again, it may be a, a longer question that you need to respond to in writing, but Chairman Hanson, anything that comes top of the mind? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I think overall across the agency, the use of technology has really accelerated during the public health emergency. So in some cases, you know, communications technology like we're using today, but also, um, uh, you know, we were able to conduct some uh, materials inspections during the height of the pandemic when we were really, uh, particularly, for instance, at, at hospitals where we may, in order to protect the health and safety of our employees, maybe didn't want those people to go into sure. those facilities. We were able, the licensee was able to walk around with their iPhone and uh, show our inspectors remotely the safety and security measures that they had in place so that our inspectors could ensure that that was going on. I thought that was a very innovative use of technology. Um, I, you know, I respect and, and I deeply appreciate the need for boots on the ground, but I think that kind of thing is innovative yeah. and we should maybe think about that going forward. Let me, let me just ask you, because it always it has been a, such a headline lately, has that increased any of our cyber vulnerabilities because of the increased use or dependence on technology? Uh, to the extent you can answer I, in this room. I think at the moment we have adequate cyber defenses. I think we're constantly looking at our, at our posture, our the attack surface, if you think about it, for the agency and our CIO organization is is evaluating that and, and making the investments necessary at this time. So, um, you know, one of the ongoing things of the 
recover from the pandemic is going to be the lessons learned. Uh, and again, I just ask each of you if you'd be willing to provide to us on the committee a kind of a, a compendium of, of lessons learned during this time. Uh, it's not just you. Uh, I, I would ask the same question of any other federal agency that we've just come through a time unlike any other, really tested uh, a lot of us in a lot of different ways. But to the extent we've learned things, let's not let that, uh, let's not, not let that go unrecorded. I thank you all for the work that you do and, and uh, appreciate so much that uh, the Adams for Peace is still alive and well and evolved into the commission we have in front of us today. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the general lady from Illinois, Ms. Shinkathne, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I uh, want to talk about decommissioning, and I, I want to thank uh, Chairman Pallone for raising the issue of um, the how local communities need to participate, and uh, Diana Deguette pointing out that, um, you know, uh, Mr. McKinley, um, I, I know that you think there's some sort of a plot here to um, undermine nuclear, but we've all seen that there are, in fact, um, safety and uh, and security issues that are involved that we have to, if we're responsible, uh, ad address that. Um, so there are um, currently 11 nuclear reactors in uh, my home state and Bobby Rush's home state of Illinois. And um, I remain uh, optimistic that uh, Illinois will continue to grow its renewable energy um, production. Um, but as, uh, a, a, as other um, technologies um, uh, de have been decreasing in, in, in the cost of production and deployment, um, what we have seen is nuclear power plants find it increasingly difficult to be um, uh, cost competitive um, while um, without, any, without any, any subsidies. Um, we see that uh, Exelon has um, indicated that it will close two of its nuclear power plants earlier than anticipated and may close um, more um, if they don't get uh, subsidies. Um, the um, fi financial um, assurances required for decommissioning are um, based on um, expected shutdown dates. So here, here's my question, um, Chairman um, Hansen. How does the NRC intend to um, um, ensure that there is sufficient funding available for decommissioning shuttered, um, uh, uh, if, uh, um, excuse me, um, if shutdown dates are accelerated for um, significant portions of the nuclear fleet. Um, thank you for that question, uh, Congresswoman. Um, we uh, get regular updates from our licensees on the status of their decommissioning trust funds. Um, we are in, in uh, frequent communication with them, and, but also uh, before they undertake activities uh, as part of the post-shutdown um, decommissioning activities report, you know, we're able to look at projected expenditures um, with the current balance of the funds, and we're able to, for instance, if, if uh, we think a licensee is getting out in front of the, the funding that's available, we're, we're able to direct them uh, to scale potentially back their activities so that there is um, sufficient funding. We have a number of mechanisms to do that. Um, uh, on basically on a biannual basis and then while decommissioning is ongoing on an annual basis so that we get updates of that, of that funding. Okay, thank you. Um, some owners and operators of nuclear power plants that have uh, or will soon be shut down are transferring licenses to uh, companies that specialize in decommissioning of nuclear power plants. Um, usually, the only asset that these um, specialized companies have is the nuclear decommissioning trust fund. Um, so again, uh, Chairman Hansen, how will the NRC ensure that these specialized companies 
are financially viable and, and, and what will the NRC do um, if one of these um, if one of these companies um, which hold as I said only um, asset uh, their only asset is that beef commission plan what if it files for bankruptcy uh, thank you congressman uh, for that and, and and I'll be happy to get back to you with kind of more details uh, for the record on this but but let me say that um, as part of the license transfer process, we look at the assets and the ability of the parent company and the ability in the court over the course of decommissioning for um, uh, the uh, site company, as it were, to have recourse back to the parent and kind of what those guarantees are. Um, I don't have all the details on the regulations on that in front of me, but I, I'd be happy to get back to you or your staff. Thank you. I think it's very, impo very important to consider this because communities can get left holding the, the bag and taxpayers can left, be left holding the bag. So um, I look forward to talking with you more about this. Thank you. And it. I yield back. Generally, you back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Lana, for five minutes. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for holding today's hearing. And I also want to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today. I know it's been a while since the NRCC's appeared before us in committee. And uh, again, I want to thank them uh, for that. Uh, Chairman Hansen, uh, I want to thank you for your service and for testifying today. And um, in your testimony, you state that one of the reasons NRCC is requesting an increase in the operating re reactors business line for fiscal year 2022 is for digital instrumentation and control, or DI and C, improvements to assess cybersecurity threats and increase protection at the NRC licensed facilities. And, and as we all know, we all are talking so much more about uh, cybersecurity. And I've been a long proponent of using the DINC to enhance the safety, reliability, and efficiency of our current nuclear fleet and the next generation of reactors. I believe DINC can offer a host of benefits to licensees, including a reduction of human error. In 2018, I uh, questioned then former NRC uh, Chairman Savicki on the, on the Commission's efforts to reduce regulatory uncertainty when it came to replacing analog system with advanced digital controls. Uh, Chairman, would you provide an update on the progress that has been made in making sure licenses have the certainty, licensees, excuse me, have the certainty they need to make these digital modifications and improvements? Congressman Latta, thank you very much for that question. Uh, digital INC is, is a, a personal interest for me and one of the um, priorities uh, for my tenure as chairman. So I'm, I'm very sensitive to this issue of uh, kind of, are we there yet uh, on, on digital INC for the, for the current fleet? And in fact, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I went up to the Limerick plant uh, in Pennsylvania uh, owned by Exelon where they're implementing a digital INC pilot project in conjunction with the Department of Energy to understand um, the upgrades that they're planning to make to their, uh, to their control room. And I've emphasized uh, with the staff on, on several occasions the need to have a, um, a, a clear and reliable um, regulatory line of sight uh, for the implementation of, of digital INC. Um, the NRC, like a lot of uh, agencies and like a lot of us in the world, we learn by doing. And so this, this project uh, in Pennsylvania is, a, is a, 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 a key part of our efforts um, to be able to evaluate the technology um, understand its safety, understand how it's going to interact with key safety systems within the plant, understand the redundancy as part of that so that we can make those safety determinations, um, uh, understand in some cases the digital signals that are coming into the control room, how those are uh, redundant and can be made safe. Um, we also have other licensees. I think the Waterford plant in Louisiana as well as Turkey Point in Florida are all also inter have expressed interest in coming to us on uh, digital INC upgrades. Um, I think as an agency, we're absolutely committed to learning further about this and uh, coming up um, with a safe and reliable and transparent process for licensing the technology. Go ahead. I, I would just add, Mr. Latta, um, just to put a little bit of context yeah. to that, because I agree with everything the chairman said. Well, I arrived on the commission in 2014, and this had been a challenging issue for years and years and years. 
and it's in the last couple of years that a lot of progress has been made on this, and I think now you're finally seeing enough issues resolved here that you have licensees wanting to submit applications to go digital on really key safety systems, which they were very reluctant to do previously because they just weren't sure if it would get approved or not or how long it might take for a review to happen and what the outcome might be. And in these last few years, a lot of progress has been made on that. And we're finally seeing folks coming forward saying, yeah, we want to upgrade uh, this key system uh, with digital, which is very good because, I mean, if you think plants operating to 80 years, they need to have modern digital uh, control rooms and other systems. We want to make sure that that's something that's doable. Well, I tell you, in my last 40 seconds, uh, let me throw this open to you all then because, you know, the this is kind of going, you know, on the timeline because, you know, you've been researching the safety and security of the DINC since about 1993. And, and I know that you want to make sure that, you know, you're getting everything all across on all the T's and dotting all the I's, but why is it taking so long on the rulemaking to get this technology out there? And I know you said you want to make sure you had everything right, but, you know, we're talking since uh, 93. Um, well, I, I, I agree with Commissioner Barron. I, I think we've made a lot of progress in the last uh, couple of years. As I said, I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive uh, to the, you know, are we there yet um, uh, kind of question on that. And I think the technical issues are being resolved at the staff level through key documents like branch technical positions and other documents um, uh, it, that's going to allow us to move forward, I think, much more uh, efficiently in the future. If, if, if I might, this is, uh, Commissioner Wright, if I could maybe just um, add a little bit here. Uh, I don't disagree with anything that I've heard from, from my colleagues here. I mean, it comes down to, you know, um, uh, regulatory certainty too, you know. We've got to be sure um, that there's a way to get it done. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, we've been doing it for a long time. If you look, the Navy's been doing it for, for a long time in, in their subs. They've got... Uh, but there's a big difference between what the Navy's doing and how they do it versus what we would have to do in, in the commercial sector uh, in our industry because the Navy's totally in control. You know, it's basically a single vendor. Um, they've got bigger budgets, obviously, but um, uh, and there's more uniformity in design. In, in our space, it probably would not be a single person. There'd probably be multiple, multiple innovators out there trying to sell their wares, and so you've got that pipeline that you've got to put in place as well. But the, te it, the ability to do it is there. Um, we just have to go ahead and work to the point where we're almost ready to pull the well, trigger. Well, my time has expired, and I, uh, I think the uh, no, no, terms of dollars. Has Thank you. The gentleman time has, has expired. Ms. Mengzui uh, is working on for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to also thank uh, Chairman Tonko for uh, convening this hearing. And I want to welcome uh, Chairman, Chairman Hansen and Commissioners Barron and Wright. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Now, as you know, there are currently 26 decommissioned or soon to be shut down nuclear plants in states and districts all over the country. However, they still have custody and responsibility of care for the used nuclear fuel that once produced electricity at these sites. Now, this spent nuclear fuel continues to burden communities uh, across the country, and uh, including my own, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, which maintains a decommissioned Rancho Seco nuclear power plant. In 2012, President Obama's Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future recommended legislative changes to authorize consolidated interim storage facilities, also known as CISFS, to uh, relieve communities for this, from this burden by transferring the used fuel from commercial nuclear power plants into temporary facilities until a permanent solution is reached. And so for this reason, I have historically introduced the Store Nuclear Fuel Act which would establish a legislative framework to develop a consolidated interim storage program at DOE. I also helped secure $20 million to start some of these efforts during fiscal year 2021. Now, my nuclear storage, uh, my storage, store nuclear storage act directs the Secretary of Energy to establish an interim storage program for high level radioactive waste and spent nuclear fuel. It will allow DOE to contract with private storage facilities capable of storing such material. Now, my question is, how would the enactment of the Store Nuclear Fuel Act affect ongoing NRC interim storage efforts? Uh, Congresswoman Matsui, thank you. Um, 
we're in the position of licensing interim uh, spent fuel storage facilities, whether those were are constructed or proposed to be constructed by private parties, for instance, like Holtec or interim storage partners in Texas, or by the federal government um, under either your act or the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, uh, for example. So um, we have obviously uh, two ongoing uh, applications before us for private spent fuel storage facilities. Um, we expect to reach licensing decisions on those um, relatively soon. I think September for the facility in Texas and uh, January of 2022 for the facility uh, in New Mexico. And, um, you know, we have the, the capability to um, uh, address additional facility applications as they might come in. So you're continuing to address this then. So you have date certain that you want to expect to complete this process. Is that correct? I'm sorry, uh, Congresswoman, could you repeat the question? I yeah, uh, so you have dates set forward in which you want to complete this process. Is that correct? We so we can look forward to uh, having this uh, issue addressed. That's, that's correct. Okay, because we have been waiting for quite some time. So there's no, um, no feeling that um, there are other safety benefits associated with storing nuclear fuel at CISF opposed to storing them and decommission nuclear plants as is currently the case. You understand what our concern is, is that we don't want these sitting in our uh, all over the country. I understand the, the concern of local communities that are hosting uh, uh, spent fuel storage facilities at, at decommissioned or uh, completely removed um, nuclear reactors like the Rancho Seco site. Um, we've determined that uh, both interim storage facilities, those interim storage facilities as well as a centralized interim storage facility are safe. Okay, fine. Thank you very much, I yield back. The gentleman lady, you expect the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mrs. Kinsinger, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our uh, witnesses for being here today. We appreciate having you, and uh, these are very important issues. At the end of 2018, legislation I sponsored, the Nuke Act, was passed by Congress and signed into law as part of the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act, known as NEMA. This is the first year that the NRC has implemented the reforms from NEMA, which changed how NRC recovers fee from fees from licensees. Specifically, it directed the NRC to recover approximately 100% of the commission's budget authority, excluding amounts appropriated for certain activities. NEMA also imposed limits on the NRC's corporate support costs to 30% of the commission's overall budget, but the agency exceeded this limit by 1% for fiscal year 2021. NEMA was intended to provide greater transparency and clarity into the NRC's fee development and to ensure that licensees pay fees only for services that the NRC actually performs. So Mr. Chairman Hanson, great to have you with us, by the way. Uh, let me just ask you, do you believe that the intent of NEMA is being fully met in the NRC's FY 2021 fee rule, or does the NRC have more work to do in future fee rules to ensure that the statute's intent is fully satisfied? Um, thank you, uh, Congressman Kinzinger. Um, yeah, we're absolutely committed to um, process improvement and transparency in the development of the, of the fee rule. And we have uh, implemented the requirements of NEMA, particularly with regard, as you mentioned, to the fee relief adjustment um, in order to increase the predictability uh, for licensees and forecasting, particularly their annual uh, reactor fees. Um, so I, I do believe that we are uh, implementing the, um, both the letter and the, and the spirit of, of NEMA in that regard. Do you think there's any more work to do or you feel like you're on the right path for this? I think we're constantly uh, looking at our processes um, to see how we can um, uh, be more reliable and more transparent in our in our um, in our fee setting. Uh, Mr. Kinsinger, okay. I just thank you. So we've oh. seen perfectly operating plants closed throughout the country solely for financial reasons, and in my own district, I have not one but two plants that are scheduled to close this year for the same reason. At the same time, 
We've seen problems arise from a decrease of baseload power on the grid, a problem that only worsens as more nuclear power plants shutter. Uh, Chairman Hanson, I'll ask you, I have two more questions too. Uh, what are the existing procedures for bringing recently closed plants back online? Should a different, more efficient licensing process be developed somewhere between a license renewal and a completely new license? Yeah, thank you for that question. We have, um, we believe our existing regulatory framework and our guidance documents actually provide for bringing a plant back online if a licensee so chooses. There are certainly uh, requirements for maintaining certain um, uh, safety systems uh, while that occurs, but we do have the, uh, the apparatus. Uh, we don't think that a, um, uh, necessarily a major rulemaking is necessary for that. Um, we believe we've got the, the guidance and the tools in-house to allow for that should a licensee so choose. So it's not, it wouldn't be basically the length of a completely new license, but it'd be somewhere in between them, in essence, renewal and new. That's right. As long as, as, long as the licensee maintained um, uh, 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 its relationship with the NRC and maintained certain safety systems and other kinds of things, um, there is a scenario under which they could um, uh, kind of restart the plant, uh, go back to operations okay. if they chose to. Yeah, I'm sure there's, go, there's go. a lot of variables in there. But in cases where reversing the decommissioning process is impossible, what about using these existing sites to host advanced reactors and small module reactors that will be brought to market soon? Um, well, there's certainly a possibility, uh, Congressman, that the um, existing uh, environmental impact statement for that site could encompass uh, future uh, nuclear uses and so might make that part of the process uh, a little more uh, streamlined. I think we'd have to evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis, but I, I certainly acknowledge the possibility. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you to the witnesses. Gentlemen, yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Ms. Kester, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman Rush and Chair Chairman Tonko, and thanks to uh, Chairman Hansen and Commissioners Barron and Wright for testifying before us today. It's vitally important that uh, we keep our existing nuclear power plants operating safely while we scale up additional sources of zero emission electricity to, to meet our climate goals. At the same time, we must ensure that the nuclear power plants are resilient to the impacts of climate change and extreme weather so we avoid outages and serious consequences like we saw in Texas earlier this year. Um, I trust that you all have seen the report from the Department of Energy that highlights how heat waves and droughts can threaten uh, the availability of nuclear plant cooling water, uh, le leading new power plants to have to reduce their electricity output. Uh, Heat-related power reductions happened in New Jersey and Pennsylvania in 2010 in Alabama in 2011 and in New England in 2012. And studies have identified that there are ongoing drought concerns for nuclear power plants in Illinois as well. And then we saw the, uh, on the flip side, the extremely cold weather uh, out of the blue uh, caused nuclear, the nuclear plants to freeze in Texas earlier this year. And then you add on Flooding in Missouri, wildfires in California also led to shutdowns and evacuations of nuclear power plants. This is very serious that these climate ampl amplified extreme weather disruptions at our nuclear power plants are reducing the reliability of the electric grid. So we had made some recommendations from the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis in our Climate Crisis Action Plan and we recommended that uh, the Congress direct the NRC to perform a fleet-wide assessment of extreme weather and climate vulnerabilities to the U.S. Uh, nuclear plants and spent fuel based upon projected climate impacts. Two, we suggested the NRC use its existing authority uh, under NEPA to conduct a rigorous climate assessment of reactors seeking license renewals, including a thorough review of vulnerabilities uh, due to potential climate impacts. And then third, uh, we wanted to, we recommended directing the NRC to require nuclear power plants to take action to address known 
flood risks, uh, seismic risk consistent with federal flood risk management standards. And thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Barron, you, you mentioned this as well. So Chairman Hansen, how is the NRC ensuring that the existing fleet is resilient to climate impacts? And would you consider performing that fleet-wide assessment uh, and cataloging the vulnerability so we know how to address it? Uh, thank you, uh, Congresswoman Kester, for that. Um, we do evaluate uh, climate impacts and uh, impact of greenhouse gases uh, on our plants as part of the NEPA process. So for example, we considered those, in, uh, those issues as part of the um, uh, uh, Turkey Point uh, subsequent license renewal as well as the uh, Vogel um, license for the facility in Georgia. Um, at, the, at this time, following the uh, external hazards analysis, following the Fukushima event, you know, all of um, all measures necessary for adequate protection of the plant are required at those uh, facilities. Certainly, licensees have taken additional voluntary measures, and um, and I, I acknowledge that um, you know one of the issues of the mitigation of beyond design basis events rules. Um, is this issue between what is required and, and, and what is voluntary. Um, but at this time, you know, we're working with licensees and with the addition of our inspectors to evaluate all the external hazards facing each of our licensees, whether that's flooding or heat or um, tornadoes. Of course, we had the derecho event in 2020 at the Dwayne Arnold plant in Iowa um, and uh, other kinds of issues. So this is a this is an issue where we are constantly getting feedback and evaluating that feedback and evaluating the safety posture of our of the facilities under our oversight. I don't know if Commissioner Barron or Commissioner Wright want to weigh in on that. Well, I would just add uh, that um, you know one of the things we learned from Fukushima um, and and all the science that we looked at after that was that uh, and that we know from climate science is flooding, hurricanes, snow and ice loads uh, are expected to pose greater challenges. Uh, to nuclear power plants and the grid in the future than they have in the past. And I think, what does that mean for NRC? We need to stay up to date with the latest uh, science and incorporate that knowledge uh, into our standards and our oversight. Uh, and that's an important aspect. Part of it is the post-Fukushima rule you mentioned, but even more broadly than that, just understanding what's the very latest on the potential risks and hazards at these locations and what does that mean for any changes that need to happen at the plants. If, yes, if, we need to expect the unexpected. Thank you very much. I yield back. The gentleman lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffin, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank the. Uh, I appreciate the commissioners uh, being here today, and it's good to be in the room with witnesses and actually able to look folks uh, in the eye. So thank you all very much. Uh, to provide protection against regulatory overreach, the backfit rule requires that the NRC must conduct a cost-benefit analysis to justify the imposition of a modification on an NRC license. The proposed modification can only be imposed if the cost-benefit analysis establishes, establishes that there is a su substantial increase in safety. Chairman Hansen, for several years, the NRC has been working on updating its guidance document on the backfit rule to provide greater clarity to both the NRC staff and licensees on implementation of the rule. The staff provided its proposed update to the guidance document to the commission in March of this year. When will the commission finalize its votes on the guidance document? Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Griffith. Um, as you noted, it's before the commission. We're each taking uh, a look at it. Certainly the backfit issue, I can tell you personally, is new to me uh, coming onto the commission. And so uh, it's something that I look forward to taking a close look at. I, I don't know. Well, the main thing is how long do you think it's going to take before you get it finalized? Is that going to be two months, three months, six months? I mean, I'm not going to hold you to it. I'm just getting an idea or five years. <laughs> uh, I'm not aware of a particular uh, um, deadline on that. Of course, each of us. Um, uh, prioritizes our work and when there's a critical mass, in this case, a critical mass of three, then uh, then these issues uh, are, are resolved. All right, well, let me move on. Uh, I've got some other questions on that. Commissioner Wright, it's my understanding that the proposed revisions to this guidance include a substantial discussion on the concept of forward fitting, which occurs when the NRC conditions its approval of a licensee requested licensing action on the licensee's compliance 
with a new requirement that was not part of the request. In other words, they make a request to make a change that they think is good for safety uh, and, and efficiency, and then uh, forward fitting would say, well, we're gonna add on some extra things. That being said, do you agree that without additional guidance on when the NRC may impose a forward fit, licensees may be disincentivized from pursuing licensing actions, including ones that may actually improve the plant performance if they run the risk of being forced to comply with additional new requirements that was not within the scope of their request? So I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, the, uh, uh, and we've got to stay within our mission, okay? I'm, I've umpired baseball for almost 50 years, okay? Um, and I use the analogy that the, our mission is that strike zone right over home plate, right? And everything that we do has to go right to, the, to our mission, which is, to, is reasonable assurance, right? Um, so in the forward fit policy, you know, it's designed to add discipline to the process, um, imposing some new requirements or, or staff interpretation of the requirements as a condition. Um, I, so it's intended to ensure that these new requirements have a direct relationship to the proposed action. Um, as, but as you know, sometimes they can overstep bounds, and, and that has happened. You know that. I know that as well. So we're not going to hide behind that. Um, uh, but I think that, uh, um, that the licensee, if he can maintain reasonable assurance that, you know, um, then he's met his mission and we should approve it. You know, the quite honestly, there's an example I'll give you. It's, you know, when the licensee proposes the use of an older version of a, a design code um, that's currently approved by the NRC, but the staff wants to require a, new, a newer version of that code, right? Um, so the staff's got to be able to demonstrate that that's that the, that's there's something in that newer code that absolutely is essential, right? Uh, and if they can't do that, then they have to let the licensee, you know, use the older code. Uh, yeah. that, that's the way to go. And my concern in other uh, arenas and other fields, we've seen where regulations of that set or that nature, where people are afraid, it creates a situation in industries where they just won't come in and ask to make any changes. Uh, because they're afraid additional, more expensive changes will be added onto them that have nothing to do with the requested change, and so that's a real problem. So it sounds like to me you would be in support of clarifying the guidance documents so that it fits that mold that you were just talking about. Am I correct in that? Uh, correct, yeah. And I, by, by the way, I did take the backfit training uh, that was offered by the staff, so I uh, did it very early. Um, and I do think that, that the, the document, the, the, what that's before us that we're considering, I don't think it's too far away, um, you know, uh, I won't say where we all are in it, but it's pretty yes, close. All right. I appreciate it, and I'll, con I'll continue to keep an eye on this. Thank you so much for your time, and I yield back. The gentleman goes back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarmaine, for five minutes. Mr. Sarmaines, you're recognized. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes. Well, I thank the chairs for holding this hearing, and I thank the commissioners and all the NRC staff for your service. Um, Chairman Hansen, you testified that the final rule for 10 CFR Pipe 53 is expected by the end of 2024, well ahead of the NEIMA deadline. Could you explain how the final rule will be ready so far ahead of the previous schedule? Uh, yeah, um, Congressman, I think one of the key ways is by having uh, frequent interactions with stakeholders up front. Uh, on key technical issues, on the critical issues with regard to, I think as Commissioner Barron rightly noted, probabilistic risk assessment versus defense in depth, and resolving those issues and, and um, conducting those interactions and, and really the development of rule language in an iterative fashion, um, I think in this case has the potential to um, uh, greatly accelerate the schedule. And I think uh, the staff is, um, uh, 
is doing a very admirable job in that. I do also want to note, however, that it's really important for us to get this rule uh, right. And so, you know, should there be a need for additional time on the 2024 timeline, um, you know, I've certainly made it, tried to make it clear to staff for my part that, um, uh, you know, having a framework that um, in which we can make safety determinations and security determinations for the adva these advanced technologies is, is, uh, is critically important. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, Chairman, uh, the NRC, is the NRC prepared from a staffing and technical expertise perspectives to meet a growing demand for advanced nuclear? Uh, I think we are getting more prepared uh, every day. Uh, we are having frequent interactions with potential licensees. Um, we're encouraging those interactions through the submission of topical reports that address key technical issues on the technologies that could come before us. We are educating our staff by our staffs by working with the Department of Energy through the Memorandum of Understanding under the, um, the uh, Nuclear en Energy Innovations Capabilities Act with the Department of Energy um, so that we're uh, more familiar with those technologies. Uh, and we're working with uh, the national labs uh, on some of that as well. So uh, we'll be ready uh, when they when they submit. So I take it that the NRC is keeping up with the changes in the industry by your answer there. Um, moving on, currently there are over 80,000 tons of nuclear waste in the United States in inventory in insufficiently secure facilities across 35 states. Moreover, it's unlikely that the state of Nevada will ever allow Yucca Mountain to be used as a nuclear waste repository. Uh, this is irresponsible and dangerous to have that quantity of nuclear waste with no realistic plan. Uh, what are any alternative nuclear waste storage methods that would be considered or that have been approved? Uh, Congressman, we have before us a couple of uh, interim storage applications for private uh, spent fuel storage facilities. Uh, one in Texas and one in New Mexico. We're, we're moving ahead with um, uh, reviewing uh, those applications and we'll make final uh, decisions here in the next few months on, on both of them, one in, in September and, and one in January. Um, uh, we're open. Um, for other applicants who are interested in, in uh, whether federal or private, uh, who might um, uh, choose to submit an application for uh, one of these facilities going forward. Are there any other uh, alternatives such as reprocessing or horizontal and vertical drilling? You know, it, it seems like uh, we need more than what you're you're proposing there. Uh, well. Congressman, it's, it's really, uh, it's not for the NRC to propose these things. We have uh, strictly a regulatory and, and safety role under both the Nuclear Waste Policy okay, Act. Okay, I, 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 get, I get it, uh, I, I get that, we've heard that. Uh, what, what does it take then to get a permit for alternative storage methods once they've been approved? What's it gonna take to say, for someone to wanna uh, to, to, to deposit uh, waste in Texas or New Mexico? Yeah, I would have to um, get back to you on the specific details on, on what would be required, but I think in, in brief, there would have to be a, um, a, a safety case made with regard to isolation from people in the environment of, of that waste over uh, um, a certain period of time, whether it's the 40-year initial license period for the facilities in Texas or New Mexico, or if you're talking about horizontal or vertical drillings, perhaps deep geologic disposal under longer time frames. All right, well, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the NRC commissioners for joining us today. You know, nuclear power generation, along with coal and natural gas, are indispensable in providing the American people with reliable, large-scale baseload electricity, and that will remain a fact far into the future. According to the best estimates, replacing the generation from an average nuclear plant, carbon-free generation, I might add, you would need to cover some 300 to 400 times down amount of land in renewables with wind and solar. 
Replacing nuclear energy or coal and natural gas, for that matter, with large-scale wind and solar, as my Democratic colleagues suggest, is not only impossible, it's just simply counterproductive. Keeping America's nuclear fleet operating is crucial to our energy security and our environment. By nature, the nuclear sector is uniquely complex and highly specialized, with supply chains and lead times that cannot simply be turned on and off. This is why it is imperative that we safeguard the next generation of nuclear technology, our domestic nuclear industrial base, and America's ability to remain a world leader in exporting innovative nuclear technology. Also, it bears mentioning that Tens of billions of public and private dollars have been invested in American nuclear innovation in recent decades, with many promising technologies right around the corner. American taxpayers, consumers, and innovators deserve to get a return on this investment, and the NRC's mission is critical to realizing that goal. So, Chairman Hansen, Today, with about 151 new reactors in the planning phase around the world and over 300 totally uh, around the world being proposed, the U.S. industry faced a stiff competition from nation state programs in Russia and China who threatened to dominate emerging markets. America has to take practical steps to maintain our competitive edge. Part of this involves R&D and part involves updates for licensing so we can do a better job of deploying new technologies. With the recent awards under DOE's Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, the NRC will receive multiple license applications for commercial and research reactors in the near future. So while the NRC will need to ensure safety and efficiencies in reviews will needlessly cause uh, increase cost and cause delays. So my question to you, is this, Commissioner Hansen? Is the NRC prepared to review these applications within the next few years? And how will the NRC avoid unnecessary delays? Uh, Congressman, thank you for that question. I believe we are prepared in the next few years to uh, review these applications. With regard to the advanced reactor demonstration program applications that you mentioned, we've had uh, ongoing um, discussions in the case of X Energy, we had ongoing interactions with them even before the ARDP award was made uh, about their technologies. Um, and through the submission of technical reports, with in the case of TerraPower, it's been more recent, but um, we expect to have substantive and ongoing interactions with them as well. This is going to help prepare the agency for when those applications come in to, um, to efficiently review them. I think as I, as I may have mentioned earlier, the goal uh, with these new technologies uh, is to uh, review and make licensing determinations in about a 42-month time frame, uh, which is uh, significantly shorter than, uh, than uh, historically available. And uh, as I said, we're committed to not being an impediment to, these new, um, to the deployment of these new technologies, um, you know, consistent with our overall safety mission. Okay. Uh, and, and can any of you comment on how the development of Part 53 fits within the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program's timeline? And what does a successful outcome to licensing uh, the ARDP reactors look like to the Commission? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, that's a great question. I, I admit that there's a little bit of a... a I don't want to call it a, a, a disconnect, but a, a maybe a gap between the development of Part 53 and the ARDP timeline. I would say um, I think TerraPower is still evaluating how they intend to come to the commission for a license, but X Energy has certainly already uh, seems to have appeared to have made that decision um, within our existing framework and is communicating with us about um, which parts of our existing framework may apply to them or not. Um, uh, so, with regard to Part 53, then, um, uh, you know, we look forward to having, uh, even before we finish, an understanding from potential applicants about how um, they intend to engage with that uh, licensing so that when we're done and when they're ready to submit, we have a clear framework and a clear path forward um, uh, for uh, um, addressing those applications. 
Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank um, all the chairmen for holding this hearing. And also, I want to thank the three commissioners for being here. Um, as you know, Vernon, Vermont is the home to Vermont Yankee. Uh, and that was the first commercial plant in the country to be sold for decommissioning. Uh, and it's likely the plant will be fully decommissioned within a decade and within budget. Uh, that's the way it's looking right now. But from the beginning, there's been a real lack of uh, coordination and support from the NRC with the local communities that are profoundly affected by the decommissioning. And I know that you are working on rulemaking uh, to address the decommissioning process. And I recently sent you a letter and I just want to outline some of the priorities that I and some of my colleagues mentioned and get your response to them. We want increasing com community involvement. You know, once that plant closes, all those jobs are gone and it really has an impact on the community. Formal NRC approval of de decommissioning plans. Licensee financial support for citizen advisory boards. Preference for prompt decommissioning, decon over deferred commissioning, safe store. And regulations to ensure that the nuclear decommissioning trust is used strictly for statutorily authorized purposes. Uh, how, I'm going to ask the chairman, how would you evaluate the NRC's level of engagement with host communities relative to the engagement with other parties, such as the Nuclear Energy Institute and license holders in matters related to the development of a, a decommissioning policy? Mr. Chairman? Um. Well, certainly, Congressman Welch, we appreciated getting we appreciated getting your letter uh, on this subject and and the letter uh, signed um, by the senators and and other parties and uh, as kind of representatives of the local communities. Um, we did also, as part of NEMA, um, conduct a series of public meetings around the country about and and um, documented best practices for community uh, advisory boards. Um, and we're able to, I think, get some useful feedback on uh, on our uh, decommissioning processes. Um, Can you be specific? Uh, I'm Can sorry. Specific? I, I, unfortunately, I don't have the details of the of the community advisory board uh, report in front of me. I'd be very happy to get back to you um, uh, for the for the record on that. Um, All, right. All right. Let me ask uh, Commissioner Barron. Uh, currently, post uh, shutdown decommissioning activity reports are submitted to the NRC, but the NRC does not offer formal approval of these important outlines for decommissioning. What, what's the purpose of not requiring the NRC to formally approve, approve these? Yeah, I, I share your question, Congressman. I, I think collecting a post-shutdown uh, decon uh, decommission activity report without NRC substantively uh, assessing its content or making a decision to approve or disapprove it doesn't really do much to protect health and safety. I, uh, and I think taking public comment on that document and then not taking any kind of action uh, about the adequacy of the report, I, I do think it kind of is a hollow gesture. I think there are really um, a few problems, I think, with the way it's done now with the, with the, with the, activity, the decommissioned activity reports. It, it leaves NRC no real decision-making role on the, on the process of decommissioning, uh, and it has two big effects. Mm -hmm. You don't have an environmental review up front. It could wait decades uh, to the very end of the process, and you don't have an opportunity for communities or others to make any, uh, raise any concerns in the adjudicatory process. That also follows at the very end of the process when all the work's done, all the money's expended, and it's been decades potentially. And so um, I, I also, you know, I agree with the point you made that we, as part of this decommissioning rulemaking, need to take a real look at that. I think a model where NRC is deciding on a document, a decommissioning plan, a detailed plan, making a regulatory judgment about it, also gives us the opportunity to do the environmental re review up front when, when it makes sense and engage state and locals. We could have a requirement, for example, that says before you submit a, dr uh, a decommissioning report to the NRC, you got to share it with the state government and give them an opportunity to take uh, make comments on that. I think that would be a great way to really give states a seat at the table. And then moving up the environmental process, moving up potentially the adjudicatory process, gives all the state and local stakeholders an opportunity to engage much, much earlier than they do now. 
Well, thank you, Commissioner. Mr. John, I wonder if you could follow up on that. This, again, let me just elaborate a little bit on what's happening in Vernon. Uh, it's a huge impact on the community, as you know, when a, a plant closes down. And there's an effort on the part of the local people to revitalize the economy in the face of those lost jobs. And the citizen engagement is really essential to that. Can you comment on how you see that fitting into your plans? Mr. Chairman? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was a question for Commissioner Barron. I apologize, Congressman Welch. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we're going to be, um, well, let me say first of all that, that the, the ultimate standard for decommissioning is a free release of the site. That is an unrestricted use of the site. And throughout the decommissioning process, that's the standard to which we hold um, uh, the uh, decommissioning owners, the, our licensees. And so um, I, I think that's one of the, the key ways uh, potentially that could uh, benefit uh, local communities because it makes that site available for reuse. It's not a brownfield at that point. It's actually a greenfield, uh, assuming, uh, right, um, addressing, of course, I, I understand there are issues potentially with the spent fuel. But, but overall, it does make that um, site uh, available um, uh, for a whole uh, variety uh, of uses. Well, thank you very much. My, my request is that not just with the Vernon facility, but all these others that are coming offline, uh, that the NRC be very responsive uh, to the input from citizen advisory boards that have the best interest of the uh, community at stake. And I look forward to working with you and the, and the NRC on that. Thank you. I yield back. The yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Mushan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Barron, I just, since you mentioned it a bunch of times, uh, what's your definition of environmental justice? And, and how is that applicable to uh, the NRC and what you're doing at the NRC? Sure. I mean, you know, when we're doing, when we're looking at environmental justice, we're looking at potentially disproportionate impacts on disadvantaged communities, on minority communities. Okay. Can I, can I interject there? Sure. Um, I would suggest you look, I represent Southwest Indiana and we have all kinds of ozone alerts and other things. I'd suggest you look at that area of the country and look at our demographics mm -hmm. and um, make sure that whatever definition you have in, in you know, may include areas of the country that may not fit your na political narrative, but may also have be disadvantaged as it relates to air quality and issues related to that. So again, so that's, you know, I, I just don't see where the NRC is has a substantial role to play in this. Well, can I, if you just... Yeah, go ahead, sure. One of the things I think we need to look at is just some of our, our processes and procedures. If you've got a community uh, that wants to raise a concern, we've got processes for that. Are they set up to be accessible in a way that really works for folks, or is it really tough to engage or requires a lot of sure. expertise and Fair lawyers enough. and stuff? And those are the kinds of things that, you know, Mr. McKinley talked earlier about, is it all about a licensing decision? I think there's a lot of other things that we could look at and make sure that we're responsive to folks who care about yeah. these facilities. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just think we need to be careful when that every hearing we have that we have to have some political talking points as part of our testimony. And I think um, without really good definitions, facts, statistics to back, back that up, and this is one of those. Uh, not saying that you're wrong, I'm just saying that I'm not sure why, why this is applicable at an NRC hearing. Well, and the, and the NRC staff's going to take nine months to look at this. We're not jumping any conclusions. Or Understood. Any decisions Fair enough. Uh, Chairman Hansen, Congress enacted free reform, fee reforms and put a cap on the corporate support uh, in the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act. This requires budget, budget discipline. Last year's defense bill required a similar discipline to limit overhead costs on all congressional program increases. The result was the Department of Defense developed better systems to track overhead costs. What is the NRC doing to better track costs? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for that. Yeah, we, we've, um, uh, we've developed some uh, budget execution tools to better track costs. 
uh, in addition, uh, from our CFO's office across the enterprise, but also within the programs themselves, uh, we are better tracking actual costs. So uh, for specific licensing actions now, we've developed um, uh, data tools, visualization tools that put to put those tools in the hands of program managers so that they can see the level of effort, so they can see the hours that are being billed against specific licensing actions, yeah. not only so that they can track those, but so that our, um, our applicants can track those as well, and they can see there's some transparency around that. Great. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, as the Commission works to develop a new regulatory framework for advanced reactor, reactors, and some of this you may have already discussed, what is it doing to ensure the appropriate staff capacity and expertise will be available to address the incoming license applications four or five years down the line? Mm -hmm. And Chairman, I'll let you start with that. Sure. Because uh, that's going to be important, right? Absolutely, Congressman. Um, you know, I've talked a little bit about uh, pre-application interactions with licensees. Uh, let me highlight uh, some of the work we're doing in strategic workforce planning, where we're trying to look two and three and four years down the road and yeah. identifying those key skill sets and identifying whether we can take people within the agency that may have adjacent skill sets and retrain them for those new capabilities down the road, or whether we need to go hire or recruit them, and whether that's new employee, you know, fresh out of college, master's degree students, which we have, which we're implementing programs for now, or whether that's uh, mid-career people that we need to come in and be project managers and leaders within mm -hmm. the agency. So we're really uh, attacking this problem on multiple fronts. Great. Maybe I'll go to Commissioner Wright since he hasn't got, had a chance to talk yet. And that's perfectly okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so I agree. I agree with uh, with Chairman Hansen about the, you know our, our efforts in strategic workforce planning. And in the last couple of years, and I, I've been kind of following this personally because I actually had some of the summer interns and the NRAN students that we have. They actually came up to my office and sat with me and told me where they thought some of the weaknesses were uh, with the NRC going out and, and recruiting new talent because that we were behind the curve and, and, and other agencies were getting the cream of the crop. Um, so we have really modified our, the way we're going about um, uh, recruitment at the college level. We're, we've got high schools uh, involved uh, we're, it, we're, and we're, we're utilizing their input, right? And, um, and they actually are, they're, and they're coming to work for us. Right. We're, we're identifying well, people who really can add value to us, specifically going into the areas that you're talking about, which is the future. Thank you. My time has expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you all for being here. The chairman yields back. The chair now recognizes the general lady from New York, Ms. Clark, for five minutes. I thank you, uh, Chairman Rush, Chairman Tonko, Ranking Member Upton, and Ranking Member McKinley for holding today's important hearing on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's fiscal year 2022 budget request. Let me thank you as well to Chairman Hansen, Commissioner Barron, and Commissioner Wright for joining us to offer your testimony. The Biden administration has signaled a renewed commitment to nuclear energy as critical to achieving their ambitious climate goals, a commitment that includes the development of new forms of advanced nuclear energy technologies. The administration's fiscal year 2022 uh, budget request would direct $700 million to the Department of Energy to start the development of advanced nuclear technology, including $245 million to build two new advanced nuclear reactors that would be operational within seven years. As the agency in charge of protecting public health and the environment from the use of nuclear material, NRC will undoubtedly have a significant role to play in the licensing and regulation of these advanced facilities. Commissioner Barron, it is encouraging uh, to hear from your testimony that NRC plans to establish an updated regulatory framework to ensure the safe operation of next generation facilities. Can you elaborate on how NRC standards and regulations will adapt to these technological advances in nuclear reactor technology? Sure. Yeah, this is this is the so-called Part 53 rulemaking. I, I hate throwing around regulatory parts of people, but um, you know, it's it's the idea of having basically a third new pathway um, for licensing uh, advanced reactors. We've got the two existing ones. This would be a third option, and the idea here is to have something that's risk and for performance based, technology neutral, so that any of these different types of reactors that might come along 
or on the scene now um, in conversations with us would be able to use the same framework. It's not gonna be uh, a prescriptive based on a very particular type of technology. It's gonna be uh, broader, more performance based. And you know, and we've talked a little bit about some of the key issues there. One is how much are we gonna rely or how much is the rule gonna rely on um, quantitative models versus other ways of proving safety. And another thing that we've all alluded to is really striking this balance between how do we take uh, into account uh, potential safety enhancements and new technologies, and how do we balance that with having defense in depth, multiple layers of defense against radiological uh, releases. And, and those, I think, are a couple of the big um, elements that are, are gonna be kind of focuses for a lot of the work in that area. Well, thank you. I firmly believe that any advancements in nuclear energy should coincide with more stringent environmental and public health standards. My next question, as you know, all know, our nation is facing an onslaught of high profile malware, ransomware attacks targeting government agencies, critical infrastructure and private businesses. In addition to the recent high profile attacks on the Colonial Pipeline and JBS Foods last week, Hundreds of American businesses were hit by ransomware attacks that seized troves of consumer data and forced businesses to shut down their internet servers. A successful malware attack on a nuclear facility conducted in cyberspace could potentially have devastating and fatal consequences to the physical world. Chairman Hansen, what steps is NRC currently taking to ensure that cybersecurity requirements for licensees properly address the growing and ever-changing uh, threat landscape of cyber attacks. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for that. The NRC's regulatory framework with regard to cybersecurity for nuclear power plants focuses on the what we call critical, critical digital assets, those computer components within the facility that address either safety, security, or emergency preparedness. Now, in many cases, uh, the those critical digital assets in a nuclear facility are often air-gapped from the rest of the internet. Um, they are, uh, we often um, see uh, unidirectional technology where information can only flow in one direction, but we also, and we require either those kinds of measures to be in place or equally protective me mechanisms uh, on a plant-by-plant -plant basis. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that. My time is running out, but I'm really interested in understanding what your protocols are with respect to uh, OT versus IT and the convergence of both. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I have many more questions, but uh, my time has elapsed. I'm gonna yield back the balance of my time. The gentle lady yields back. Uh, is the chair understanding that the next Four members, Mr. Mullen, Mr. Wahlberg, Mr. Carter, and Mr. Duffin are waiting their time on the past so that uh, Mr. Palmer, the gentleman from Alabama, will be the next uh, member uh, to ask questions. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, um, the chair now recognizes Mr. Palmer for five minutes. I thank my colleagues for allowing me to uh, move ahead of them in, in, in line, and, uh, uh, and I thank the chairman for allowing that as well. Uh, chairman Hansen, under the, the Nuclear Energy Innovation Modernization Act, NRC is required to develop new licensing framework for the development of advanced nuclear reactors. However, groups such as Breakthrough Institute have raised concerns about the proposed licensing framework known as 10 CFR Part 53, is overly burdensome and out of step with current technology and climate demands. They note it is expected that many advanced reactors will provide much larger safety margins relative to existing large light water reactors, but they should not be required to do so for licensing, which would result in substantial ratcheting of regulatory burdens upon licensees for technologies that offer the United States substantial environmental and energy security benefits. So my question is, can you ensure that the new licensing framework does not unfairly increase the regulatory burden on these new facilities, which in effect would deny us access to, to uh, safer and more environmental friendly facilities? Uh, Congressman, I can uh, commit that the NRC 
uh, does not intend to be an impediment to the deployment of these new technologies and that we are looking at new ways to make our safety determinations uh, through the enhanced use of data and computer modeling and other kinds of information uh, that, uh, the, you know, the kinds of information that a lot of these reactor vendors are, uh, are equipped with. Well, I raise that question in the context of, of a couple of things. One, uh, and I'll address this later about environmental justice, but the other in the context of, of losing uh, our advantages in, in nuclear technology for, uh, uh, to Russia and China. And by that I mean uh, Russia has uh, a few years ago entered into an agreement with Saudi Arabia. And uh, I think our technology, and particularly on the safety side, and this is where the NRCC, I think, I mean the NRC, excuse me, uh, the NRC would be uh, particularly interested in helping it uh, streamline the, uh, the regulatory requirements for our advanced nuclear uh, to build those in the United States, but also to uh, offer those to the rest of the world because they are the safest. Uh Congressman, the NRC, uh, we, have, we have the privilege and, and, and I might say the burden of being the gold standard of nuclear regulation throughout the world. Uh, as, I've, as I've come into this job and started to interact with my international counterparts, I see that more and more. Uh, it's my feeling that I think uh, that, that the NRC should be part of the value proposition for nuclear exports. That is, we can help countries also regulate these technologies as we uh, export them and but I'm you, go ahead I'm sorry but you understand that if you impose unnecessary regulatory burdens on the advanced nuclear reactors that it not only hurts us here in the US and, and our ability to provide co2 uh, reduce co2 emissions provide environmentally friendly uh, power and particularly in areas uh, that uh, where we talk about in, environmental justice uh, to deny people access to this power, particularly in, in lower income areas, is, is, is uh, an energy injustice. It's an economic injustice. And that uh, leads me into this uh, next point about as part of the effort of, of your staff review whether environmental justice is appropriately considered in the agency's adjudicatory, adjudicatory uh, procedures and environmental reviews and whether the NRC should uh, consider implementing environmental justice outside of uh, the uh, NEPA policy, H have you considered uh, the impact on, on lower income communities uh, by forcing them, having, having them to wait longer for affordable, clean, and safe energy? And I, I know there's uh, areas around the country that don't even ha have access to uh, natural gas. And I brought this up in several hearings. I, th I think that's an important consideration here with all due respect uh, uh, to each of you that, that we make sure that this regulatory process works in the favor of American consumers and particularly people who don't have access to reliable energy. And I'll th I, any one of you or all three of you can respond to that. Want to take it? Go ahead, Commissioner. Um, so I agree with you. Um, and, and I think that, that we as an agency, because we are safety experts, right? Uh, we're not promoters. Uh, we need to be th be sure things are done safely. Our staff is the NEPA expert, right? And everything that we do, we need to stay within our swim lane. We need to stay with, with consistent with our mission, and that it that that includes the the staff review on on environmental justice as well. You know, we can't be a barrier to innovators and innovation. We've got to be able to um, uh, allow there to be regulatory certainty to get these things to market. We, you know, our, we have principles of good regulation that we have to operate by, um, but that does not preclude us or prohibit us from being part of the value um, uh, chain that, that the chairman referred to. So we've got to, you know, if there's opportunities through existing laws like NECA and, uh, and other ways for us to do uh, work with DOE better, to work with other agencies, work with you, then we need to be open to doing that, but with, we've got to stay within our swim lane. Uh, as an agency, uh, which is the reasonable assurance standard. My time has expired again. I thank the chairman and the, and my colleagues who allowed me to, to go ahead of them. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Schrader, for five minutes.
Mr. Schrader, you recognize the chair now recognizes Mr. Ruiz from California for five minutes. Mr. Ruiz, uh, you recognize the chair now recognizes Mr. Peters from California for five minutes. I got you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, uh, thanks to the witnesses for being here. I um, want to talk a little bit about um, spent nuclear fuel and the storage of spent nuclear fuel. It's a top priority for my constituents and for me. There are several decommissioned or decommissioning nuclear reactors that have uh, spent fuel stored on site. It needs to be moved from sensitive locations, either they're interim or permanent storage. In San Diego County, as in some of the other places that have been mentioned already, uh, the San Onofre Nuclear Generation Station, or SONGS, is within 100 feet of the ocean. It's near dense population center. Uh, it's near multiple fault, fault lines, which poses an earthquake risk. And climate change, including sea level rise, could also pose a threat to SONGS and other sites across the nation. Uh, simultaneously, next generation uh, nuclear energy could be a key component of our clean energy future. In 2020, nuclear energy provided over 50% of the country's zero emission electricity. And in the future, advanced reactors could help us produce less nuclear waste and provide cheaper electricity. Hundreds of my constituents are working today on these advanced technologies in San Diego. So today I wanted to ask a couple of questions about exactly where we are, and I'll throw this maybe to, to Chairman Hansen. Can you tell us what the risks are that are associated uh, basically with the storage of spent nuclear fuel at decommissioned or decommissioning facilities like the San Onofre facility in San Diego? What are the risks associated with that? storage. Uh, Congressman, uh, you know, let me first by saying that I, I think that the we've determined that the spent fuel uh, stored at the San Onofre nuclear generating station and other sites around the country uh, is safe, um, that it's being stored safely. Uh, that does mean that there's zero risk, uh, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, but those risks are being uh, monitored and, and managed both by the NRC through requirements that we impose on our licensees. Great. I'm happy to hear that. I, I want to know a little bit, though, about what is it that you're watching to make sure that something doesn't go wrong? What are, what are the things that you have your eyes on in particular um, that if you weren't watching um, could cause a health risk or environmental risk? So for example, part of our oversight process really looks at the integrity of the um, facility over time, both the external structure, such as the overpacks for uh, the spent fuel canisters, as well as the canisters themselves. Um, we require our licensees to have robust monitoring programs, and we oversee those programs as well as conduct ins inspections on those facilities ourselves. If the containers were deemed, or if were, were ultimately did not have integrity, what would be the result? What could happen? Um, you know, we would have to uh, evaluate that, but uh, um, it's certainly possible that, that that container would have to be repackaged or, um, uh, um, or inserted in another um, uh, uh, canister, uh, potentially. We'd have to evaluate well, that kind of on that. a case-by-case -case basis. Sure, sure, but but obviously you're, the thing we're worried about is a, is a leak of uh, of contam a contamination, right? Um, that's what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, that's right. That's what we're trying to avoid. Isn't that okay. Right? Correct. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, and I also uh, that, that's presumably true with respect to the the outside containment. Um, and I guess what I'm what I'm interested in knowing is we've got a lot of fuel there. Uh, if we weren't taking these these precautions, uh, I assume that pr could pre present a Fukushima type risk to uh, people in the district, right? Uh, I, I'd have to get back to you on what yes. the specific uh, <laughs> accident scenarios uh, uh, would be. I, well, obviously we're, okay. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that that's happening, sir. I'm just saying that those are the kinds of things that we, we have to, to look at. And I understand that part of your purview is not uh, locating um, ultimate um, ultimate uh, disposal or long-term disposal like yucca or interim disposal. 
Uh, but I would also be be curious if we're stuck with this because, um, you know, the Biden and Trump administrations have both withdrawn support for Yucca or are against it. Uh, we're supposedly going to go down the line of asking people to please take it um, uh, based on some sort of consent. Are there ways that we can improve the oversight of these decommissioned or decommissioning facilities so that we're sure that they're safe? Um, we've determined that our uh, oversight processes for these spent fuel facilities and, and for the ongoing decommissioning activities uh, uh, are safe. Uh, uh, All right. Is it is this an ideal is this an ideal place for long term storage in your opinion? Uh, I would. I'm I'm not sure that uh, on site at these reactor facilities were uh, originally envisioned as long term storage facilities. No. All right. Well, my time has expired, uh, and thank you for being here. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma. Mr. Mullen for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and uh, Mr. Peters, I was actually kind of intrigued with your line of questioning there. I'm not sure we ever got the answers you're looking for, um, but I was definitely intrigued by what you were saying. Uh, we might be coming from two separate ends, but I definitely appreciate your, your line of questioning. Uh, Chairman Hanson, uh, I, I just I'm going to add to that just a little bit. Um, you had made mention that it wasn't ideal. How much, how much are, are, is um, the United States government through NRC right now paying in, in fines for storing these in, on site? Uh, Congressman, uh, I appreciate the question. Um, the way the, the arrangement works in the United States actually is, is that the um, power plant licensees actually have contracts with the Department of Energy. Uh, and they're, um, and the Department of Energy, I think, is obligated to perform against that contract. For the NRC, for our part, it's our job to ensure the safety of ongoing operations, including spent fuel storage at those facilities. So, so I probably, I honestly, I, I honestly couldn't tell you what, what, what the yeah, U.S. Yeah, but I probably asked that question wrong. Do you know how much we're spending in, 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 in fines or settlements with these, uh, with these sites as storing it on site? Honestly, Congressman, I don't because that's not really in the purview of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Okay. Well, let me ask another line of questions. And uh, Russia and China are rapidly exporting uh, their nuclear technology around the world. And as you know, this creates a very lasting um, a partnership when this kind of technology is shared and the facilities are built. How is the NRC uh, working to uh, improve this technology quicker so we can export our own technology around the globe? Um, the safety reviews that the NRC conducts are uh, on, on all of these technologies, both existing and new technologies, are watched around the world. Um, we and I and, and my colleagues regularly communicate and collaborate with our colleagues around the world uh, on the status of those reviews and, and what we're finding and what we're learning. Um, Do you have uh, concern with, with Russia and China's um, growing I guess, influence in the nuclear technology right now, especially with countries that um, are are an interest to both of us? Uh, I think the NRC's approach to, uh, you won't be surprised to hear, is, is approach to nuclear regulation is the right one, and I think it's worth sharing around the world uh, for our partners, well, what, whether we're exporting what technology is right or not. Because, well, but what is the right one? Because what we're doing is we're shutting down nuclear plants all over the country right now. I think seven more are slated to be shut down. So what is our approach? Um, we are continuing to uh, risk inform our approach to nuclear reactor regulation. We've had a but no, decades but you said it's the right one. I'm sorry? Well, Chairman, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be difficult here. I'm just saying that you said that you take the right approach. What is that right approach? Is that right approach no nuclear power? Because nuclear is clean and it is reliable if it's done right. And if the NRC is convinced that they can do it right, then why are we shutting down plants and why other countries are building them? Why aren't we bringing new ones online? Um, I'm sorry, Congressman. I guess I would argue that uh, the decisions to shut down uh, nuclear plants in the United States aren't related to the NRC, that these are largely due to economic factors outside of the NRC's purview. I'm, 
I'm almost shocked that you said that. I, I, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm because of the heavy regulations and the cost of meeting requirements that the NRC has put in place has literally made it where it's not economically feasible for these plants to be built, much less maintained. And NRC doesn't have any role in that. I won't say that we don't have any role, but I don't think we're the decisive factor in that. No, Congressman. That might be a big problem why we're losing nuclear power around here. If you're the chairman and you don't, and NRC doesn't see a role that they play in this or a way to figure out how to make this work be viable because energy is increasing as we're bringing down fossil fuel plants and generators, there's more reliability on nuclear. I spent just, I spent the last 15 months in California. And it's funny when I left, we started having rolling blackouts at seven o'clock because solar went offline. Uh, nuclear could easily fill that gap. And for your response to that, I'm just taken, I'm taken back. The NRC has a role to play in this. As in the chairman, as the chair of it, you should see that. I mean, that's part of your role, but uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I know I'm out of I'm out of time, and I'll yield back. The gentleman, not your man. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentle lady from New Hampshire, Ms. Kuttner, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here, Chairman Hanson, Commissioner Barron, and Mr. Wright. <clears throat> the Nuclear Regulatory Commission plays an important role regulating nuclear power plants and the civilian use of nuclear material. And I appreciate the dedication of NRC staff to keeping Americans safe. One of the plants your agency is responsible for overseeing is here in New Hampshire, the Seabrook Nuclear Power Station. Now, I'll start with the good news. Seabrook is an important source of baseload power in New England and generates enough electricity to power more than 1 million homes. The power station provides tax revenue for New Hampshire and is a good job creator for our seacoast region. More than 4 million people, including many of my constituents, live within a 50 mile radius of this power station. But nuclear, Seabrook Nuclear Power Station also has the unfortunate distinction of being the first nuclear power station in the United States to an experience an alkali silica reaction, or ASR, in the concrete structure that houses the power station. ASR causes tiny cracks in concrete, which over time can weaken the structural integrity of buildings. The NRC and Seabrook's owner have known about this issue for more than 12 years. And before recently granting a 20-year license renewal to extend Seabrook Power Station's operations from 2030 to 2050, the NRC conducted an extensive review of ASR cracking at Seabrook. As a result of this review, it proposed a number of safety conditions related to ASR cracking at the facility, including six-month evaluations, rebar analysis to screen for additional stress placed on the facility, an analysis of the concrete. Dr. Victor Sahoma, a leading expert on ASR working on behalf of the public safety group C10, recommended the NRC impose additional safety conditions on Seabrook's license renewal to ensure ASR cracking at the nuclear power plant is properly monitored. But in a frustrating November 2020 opinion, the Atomic Safety Licensing Board dismissed these safety provisions largely on procedural grounds. Commissioner Barron, in your testimony, you outlined that in recent years, there has been a counterproductive emphasis on reducing inspections and cutting costs at the NRC, but you state that you believe the NRC should, quote, improve oversight, not weaken it. What steps can be taken by the NRC to improve ASR cracking monitoring at Seabrook Station here in New Hampshire. Uh, well, I'm glad you asked the question. I, I'm actually going to be visiting Seabrook in about three weeks, and I'm and I'm looking forward uh, as part of that tour to see, um, you know, the manifestations of ASR. Ask all the right questions. We're reaching out to a number of the groups in the area before we go to see what questions they have. What do they What do they want me to ask our residents? What do they want me to ask? 
um, the licensee there. We're going to be looking around and uh, and asking those kinds of tough questions. I, uh, our our um, Atomic Safety and Licensing Board has some terrific experts, and I know they took a very hard look at this. Um, but I want to ask those kinds of follow-up questions when I'm when I'm visiting there in August. Good. Well, we welcome your visit. Um, Commissioner Barron, given that Seabrook is the first nuclear power plant to experience issues with ASR cracking, has the NRC worked with independent experts to determine the best oversight regime to ensure the safety of Seabrook Nuclear Power Station and my constituents here in New Hampshire? Uh, if, if I may, I, I'll, we'll check with our staff and get back to you, um, you know, on the record, uh, for the record for that. I, I want to make sure I don't, uh, I give you kind of a comprehensive listing of all the, the work the staff has done on that. I know they've done um, an extensive safety analysis, but you ask a very good question, which is to what extent have they gone outside the building and talked to others about that? And to be honest, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm, I'm happy to get back to you with that answer. Thank you. And please provide that list of experts uh, to the committee. And finally, has the NRC consulted with the operators of other major facilities that are experiencing a ASR cracking, like Hydro-Quebec, to determine the best practices for monitoring? Um, I, I believe the answer is yes, but at, when we get back to you on the specifics of the outreach of the staff, we'll make sure we include that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Well, Lady, you know, thank the chair. Now recognizing the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Mr. Wahlberg, you're recognized. The chair now recognizing the gentleman from Georgia for five minutes. Mr. Carter, you're recognized. Mr. Carter, you're recognized. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Duncan. Mr. Duncan, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, I want to thank Scott Peters for recognizing the nuclear waste issue. Nuclear waste sits at 121 sites in 39 states, and we need a long-term repository. And ratepayers have paid tens of billions of dollars into a fund to construct and maintain a long-term repository. That's ratepayer money, not taxpayer money uh, that, that members need to realize. Also, let me also mention that uh, we need to not cede the development of advanced nuclear technologies to China, nuclear technologies like molten salt reactors, um, which they continue to uh, construct. And we continue to down blend the seed material known as U-233 that we have in this country that would need to be seed stock for future thorium reactors should the United States decide to go that route. So that needs to be on the members uh, radar screen. Commissioner Wright, you know, as, as well as I do, the state of South Carolina is a leader in nuclear energy. We produce nearly 56% of South Carolina's electricity, 95% of the state's carbon-free electricity. And I'm a big supporter of nuclear energy as a critical part of the energy matrix, both from a reliability and environmental perspective. If we're serious about reducing emissions, nuclear has to be part of the equation. I think we've heard that over and over today from other members on both sides of the aisle. So I look forward to working with them as we move forward on modernizing and advancing our nuclear technologies across the country. But I want to address modernization efforts in NRC. As we strive for more reliable, clean power across the United States, we must make the NRC a more modern and efficient regulator. One area I believe we can modernize is the burdensome environmental review process for nuclear reactor licensing. The cost of environmental review processes have tripled over the last 10 years, and its completion takes an average of four years. I think this plays into something that Mark Wayne Mullen was talking about, uh, the rising cost, the economic factors that the chairman mentioned. It, it, it relates to the length of time and the costly environmental review process. I have a bill currently that um, would change some of that um, NRC directs NRC to examine and promulgate a final rule that allow for 
categorical exclusions, environmental assessments, generic environmental impact statements in lieu of the EISs to be used in permitting actions when appropriate. This will help lower cost expedite permitting processes for nuclear power. So Commissioner Wright, why is the current environmental review process so duplicative? Well, thank you for the question and uh, go Tigers, by the way. Um, it's good to see you again, Congressman. So I, I agree with you that, that there's a lot that can be done in, in this uh, uh, arena here. And uh, the staff's already, it, maybe you are aware, maybe you're not, but the staff has already developed several proposals uh, to do just that. Um, the commission is currently considering the staff's recommendation uh, to transform its environmental review process, which is the first wholesale uh, relook at our regulations since they were promulgated back in the 1980s, I think. So, um, so just so you know, the NRC is also at work uh, developing a notice of proposed rulemaking on the expanded use of categorical exclusions. Uh, they're considering the use of environmental assessments for additional types of licensing actions. Uh, they're developing a uh, generic environmental impact statement for advanced reactors. Um, they're updating a, uh, a GEIS as well for license renewals uh, to include additional items that can be resolved generically. And, and they're performing internal processes as well to look, focus on improvements to, uh, as, you have, as you've indicated, to modernize our review processes. So those are some of the things that we're doing right now. Um, and, you know, we look forward to working with you at, um, and, and it, 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 if your bill does uh, pass and become law, we will absolutely follow the law. Yeah. Well, hopefully we can get some uh, Democrats to sign on to that and get it moved to a hearing, Mr. Chairman. As this committee looks to address uh, climate change, we need to make sure that any legislation that alters our energy markets doesn't threaten the existing nuclear plants like we've seen in Illinois across the Midwest. Reactors continue to go offline, as we've heard, in those markets. I don't want that to happen in South Carolina. To put it in perspective, Oak Only Nuclear Station in my district houses three nuclear reactors produce more than 2,500 megawatts of carbon-free electricity. Nuclear generation capacity is at 92.5%. Other carbon-free sources don't even come close to what nuclear does. So it's got to be a part of our clean energy future. We need to ensure our licensing regulations are modernized as uh, Commissioner Wright says, and we need to keep our reactors online. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentle lady from California, Ms. Marigon, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Ruff and Chairman Tonko, for holding this important oversight hearing on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's critical that we regulate our nuclear power industry to ensure it is safe, secure, responsive to the public, and well prepared for the future. It was good to see the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's announcement last week that you will conduct a review of how the agency's programs, policies, and activities address environmental justice. Earlier, uh, there was an exchange with one of my colleagues across the aisle about the need or why, asking why environmental justice was um, being considered by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, we know there are community impacts from nuclear power plants, including potential exposure in the case of an accident. The mining industries that produce uranium and communities in the path of transported nuclear waste. It's important the commission take these factors into consideration when deciding uh, when uh, making decisions about sitting and license renewals, particularly when the impacted community is an environmental justice community already facing environmental impacts. Now, these impacted communities far too often have been low-income communities or communities of color. Uh, Commissioner Barron, did you need additional time to respond to my colleague, uh, Representative Bouchon's question about the purpose of conducting an environmental justice review? Well, I'm happy to talk more about it. I do think it's very important, and, and I emphasize it was uh, all the commissioners agreed. We were, there were four at the time. We, we all agreed it made sense to do this review, and no one's prejudging the outcome of what we think uh, makes sense. But I, I think there's a lot to look at. You know, right now, um, in NRC's licensing decisions, environmental justice is basically just a small part of an environmental impact statement. 
And that's pretty minimal treatment. And I'm not sure um, that that is inspiring a lot of confidence among stakeholders and disadvantaged communities that those factors are really playing a meaningful role in our decisions. Uh, our adjudicatory process, you know, the, the mechanism for raising concerns, whether they be safety concerns, health concerns, environmental concerns, you know, it's been characterized over the years as strict by design, really hard, a lot of hurdles, a lot of procedural hurdles, very complex. Uh, is that just another way of saying that the agency's made it hard for interested in stakeholders to engage with us and express their concerns? I worry that it, that's exactly what it is. And, um, you know, the environmental justice policy statement we have right now is from 2004. I think it definitely needs uh, to be updated. It's a pretty negative document if you read it. And uh, uh, it basically reads like a legal brief of all the things we're not going to do on environmental justice. Uh, many stakeholders criticized that document at the time, including the Bush EPA, thought it was too narrow. So I think there's a lot to look at. I, I understand some of the concerns folks are raising. Is this going to be the decisive fact that it determines whether a license gets granted or not? I don't, know, I don't know the answer to that. We need to look at the review. But I do think that there are a lot of our more procedural aspects of the way in which people can raise concerns that are pretty tough right now uh, for people to to engage, and I think we take, need to take a look Thank at that. You. Thank you for that. Um, Chairman Hansen, as part of the commission's environmental justice review, the announcement said the commission will be holding two public meetings on July 15th, that's tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, and taking public comment. Can you tell me, yes or no, because I'm running low on time, has the agency reached out directly to environmental justice communities to inform them about these opportunities for public comment? Uh, I certainly hope so, and I'll get back to you for the record, uh, yes or no on that, Congresswoman. Okay, well, given that this is tomorrow, this that's a little concerning uh, to hear, because, you know, the outreach is critical part of getting public input from the communities most impacted by the review of the commission um, and what they're undertaking. So, um, you know, depending on the attendance on the public meetings and those of tomorrow, um, I do encourage you to offer additional opportunities for the public to weigh in, particularly environmental justice communities who live near power plants, uranium mining, or transportation routes um, of spent nuclear fuel. Um, Chairman Hanser and, and Commissioners Barron and Wright, a, a 2019 United States uh, War College report found that 60% of the country's nuclear reactors are at high risk of permanent or temporary closure due to climate threats such as sea level rise and severe storms. In an earlier response, Representative Castor, you um, you said that flooding concerns are are looking to license renewals. However, the renewals only happen every 20 years. Uh, we need fast. We need to react faster to changing climate. Could maybe you respond in writing or in the future on how the regulatory, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is taking action to ensure that all of our existing nuclear power plants are prepared for climate impacts in between license renewals. I know my time has expired, so I'm going to yield back. Uh, but I do hope to get a response um, later on those questions. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah, uh, Mr. Curtis, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know that we have talked about this a lot, but I need to emphasize it again, that nuclear is a very important baseload in energy and it can generate incredible amounts of carbon-free power. I find it just so ironic that at the exact time our president has asked us to cut our carbon emissions in half, we will have also cut our nuclear um, energy in half from 20% down to 10% of the power that we use. It gets even uh, more crazy when you read the environmental justice report issued by the White House. Uh, the report says that the communities will not benefit from nuclear carbon capture, research and development, or highway expansion. I've toured uh, nuclear plants. I know many of my colleagues have. Um, I, um, I know that the places that I have seen the communities welcome these. As a matter of fact, those communities who do not want nuclear in their backyard, I would invite those facilities to come to my district, which where they would be welcomed. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that's an important consideration. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, 
How do you expect the declining nuclear reactor fleet will impact the NRC's budget and therefore impact your ability to permit future nuclear? Uh, Congressman, thank you for that question. Uh, since um, the height of the um, reactor fleet and, and uh, what we thought was the nuclear renaissance back in 2013 or 2014, um, the reactor fleet has declined by about 10 or 11 reactors in this country, so 10 or 11% from 104 down to 93. The NRC's budget uh, and staffing, we've reduced staff by 25% and we've reduced uh, our budget by uh, 22%. So we've adjusted uh, already to uh, the declining fleet and we think that we still have the resources we need to ensure the safety uh, of that fleet and stay focused on our mission. Um, so as, but let, me, let me clarify. Let me clarify the question. It's like, it, how does that impact your ability to deal with f future applications? Uh, yeah, sorry. Very, um, very good question. Obviously, we've gotten some additional funds from Congress to help us prepare for those uh, uh, new uh, applications, and we're looking at um, at staff. We're we're. As people come in, they will pay us fees, and we'll use those fees to pay staff to but, review those applications. Uh, and I hate to cut you off, but you know we're all uh, uh, so short on time. Would you consider options for adjusting your licensing fee model to incentivize and account for the public benefit that comes from nuclear? Um, and is that something that you would consider? We're, we're happy to work with, uh, with you and other members of Congress on any changes you would like to consider to our, uh, our, uh, our fee structure. Uh, there's an organization in Utah called UAMPS. It's an acronym. It represents 49 cities, municipal power cities. Over five years ago, they had the forward thinking um, uh, idea and acknowledged the importance of advanced nuclear. They submit, submitted a 12,000 page document 42 months later, the NRC issued its final safety evaluation and told their DCA cost over $500 million. And you can see how, why some of my colleagues are concerned about the barriers out there. Ultimately, uh, they created the first ever NRC license project in the country. We're pretty proud of that from Utah. Do you agree that licensing new advanced reactors provides an important public benefit? I'm sorry, provides what kind of benefit, uh, Congressman? I didn't quite catch that. An important public benefit. Uh, I, I, I think we have a role in determining uh, the safety of, of, these, um, uh, of these technologies, and I think Understand. that safety determination provides is, a public benefit. No, no, no. The, the question is, licensing new plants, is that an important public benefit? We're we're not in the unfortunately, Congressman. We're we're not in the the policy making uh, uh, benefit or area of this for uh, um, the deployment of reactors. We don't we want to be as efficient as possible I'm in our reviews. I'm not asking you to make policy. I, listen, let me cut to the chase. I hope that you'll evaluate the fee structure and and the barriers to innovative technologies that are keeping uh, this nuclear from coming into a real reality. You can see with a 12,000 page document and $500 million, how many people can, can actually really do that? And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield. The gentleman, gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman lady from President Biden's home state, Ms. Blunt Rochester of Delaware for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you also to Chairman Tonko for calling this very important hearing. Um, and I also want to thank the witnesses. Um, as we've heard throughout this hearing, climate change has made extreme weather events more frequent and more intense. And as the country continues to witness an unprecedented heat wave and battle a record-breaking wildfire season, it is clear that we need to be better prepared and that our nuclear infrastructure needs to be prepared against future climate change vulnerabilities. Climate change considerations need to be incorporated into the design, planning, and ongoing maintenance of nuclear facilities to ensure the resiliency of these facilities and the safety of the surrounding communities. 
I want to follow up on questions um, from Ms. Castor as well as Ms. Barragan. Um, Commissioner Barron, could you, um, we know that nuclear power plants uh, use large, many use large quantities of water for cooling, and they're especially vulnerable to extreme climate events. Increasing temperatures like we've seen this summer have forced reactors to go offline and reduce capacity in the past. How is the NRC helping to support the nuclear power industry in preparing and retrofitting their facilities for rising air and water temperatures? Well, it's, it's a good question, and I would just kind of distinguish between two types of um, extreme weather that we would be focused on and concerned about uh, with climate change. One, um, our extreme weather events like, say, hurricanes or flooding uh, that could threaten in a, in a very immediate way um, the safety of a plant. And there, um, there's been so much post-Fukushima done um, to better improve the safety of the plants to deal with those kinds of situations. As I mentioned earlier, I think there is still something to do there to better protect that additional equipment we have on site to make sure that it is protected against the latest uh, science about flooding hazards in particular, but also seismic hazards. There's a separate question you raised, um, not to say it's not important, but it's a little different, which is uh, what about rising temperatures of the water that's used for cooling water, or what about the level of the water if you have a drought? Um, and there it's a little different because you don't have that acute safety threat. It could affect, though, whether the plant can operate or not, right? If you don't have enough cooling water or if your cooling water is warmer than the plant needs it to be or is established in our, in our technical specifications, the plant may have to reduce power or shut down for a period. So those are, those are both things that we look at. Me, I work, I, I, I'm focused in particular on that first piece to make sure we have uh, the right protections and resilience for equipment on site to ensure safety, even if you have an event that, you know, maybe what used to be a once in a century event and now we're seeing much more common. Right, right. You actually preempted my next question, which was going to be about um, floods and, and hurricanes. Um, but I, I, I want to um, dig a little bit deeper. Um, first of all, I want to ask about um, site planning for future nuclear waste repositories and what kinds of things are you incorporating? You know, and maybe even a larger question I have is sort of like the connectivity between what you do and those who are looking at the trends in our weather and how it's been um, uh, exacerbated and moving much rapidly. Can you talk a little bit about both the future and what kinds of things that NRC is doing to incorporate um, these concerns into site planning, but also could you talk a little bit about who you partner with and, and to and and are is there data available that shows you know these trends that are coming? Sure, this is really one of the sure. lessons we had learned from Fukushima is that on on the latest science of natural hazards, we were as an agency just too reactive. We would wait for folks to submit additional information to us and then evaluate it and see did something need to be done. One of the things we've done post Fukushima is to be much more proactive, to go out there and make sure our folks are really aware of the latest science. So if it's, say, flooding, we're interacting with other federal agencies that are the experts in flooding. We're going out and getting the data. We're interacting with academia. We're interacting with international organizations to make sure we're getting all the latest information, cataloging that, and then proactively figuring out, okay, based on what we now know, do we need to look at whether anything needs to be adjusted at any of the nuclear power plants to make sure that they're adequately protected? And that kind of information is much more proactive and continuous than it used to be. And I think it's a really positive development. It's an important part of being ready for climate change impacts. Thank you so much for sharing that. I will follow up with you afterwards. Um, but I just want to share, I was actually in Shanghai when Fukushima happened and understand how um, what a threat this can be um, and why it's so important for um, proactive planning. So I look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from my birth state, the great state of Georgia, Mr. Carter, for five minutes. I didn't realize that, Mr. Ranking Member. Thank you. I'm glad to know that. Albany. Albany. Great, great, great area. 
Well, yes. thank you for, for this hearing. And I'm glad that we're finally having this hearing on with the NRC today, NRC today. Um, it's, it's really a great opportunity for us to, to show how important nuclear energy is and, and, and really because we know that it's the only energy source that delivers reliable 24-hour carbon-free energy, and that's extremely important. And solar and wind and power and all the other um, renewables are certainly important, and we don't deny that, but in an all of the above energy strategy for us to reduce our emissions, nothing beats the reliability that nuclear energy gives us. And I want to thank you also, all of you, for mentioning uh, Vogel and the construction of the only two, the only two nuclear reactors right now in the United States are the construction of them here in the state of Georgia. And I'm very proud of that because not only are they going to be able to provide baseload power, but they also providing good paying jobs and reliable rates for customers in Georgia for many years to come. I want to start, um, first of all, with, uh, I guess I'll ask um, Commissioner Wright uh, this one. Commissioner Wright, we all know that um, that large light water reactors such as these, such as this and that um, at Vogel three and four are expensive and time consuming to build. But isn't it also true that when they're completed that Vogel three and four will be a significant source of energy that is for electricity that is carbon free? Thank you uh, very much. And, and in a previous life, I was an economic regulator in South Carolina too, so have some knowledge of how, um, the, you know, what happens to plants as they get older and, and, and the, how the cost goes, gets lower and, and gets, you know, actually provides a, a huge benefit. So, uh, I, I, so I, I to, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that, uh, uh, you know, once it goes online um, and it, as it goes into the life of the plant, it will become much more um, valuable, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, that's my next question, and thank you for, for acknowledging that, because don't we need both our existing fleet and new reactors like Vogel 3 and 4 to meet our national carbon dioxide um, goals? So, um, and, and I'm going to answer your question. I'm, I'm not going to dodge it, but I, I do want to preface it by, again, this is you know, it's my opinion, and, and you know we, we're a safety regulator, so we've got to make sure that whatever's there is, is operating safely. So within our mission, but yeah, I do. Um, um, I do agree with you there. You know, um, I do think that we've got to have uh, you know, everything available, and and we need to be sure that within doing what we need to do as regulators at at, at the NRC, that we provide, um, you know, the pathway, the regular regulatory certainty, um, and and performing our mission that we're not a barrier to innovators or innovation and. Um, uh, be it advanced reactors, micro reactors, uh, you name it. We don't know what else other technologies are out there that are going to be coming. But you know, our goal and and our we have to endeavor to be ready for whatever comes. Well, very quickly, don't you agree that the successful completion of of units three and four at Vogel will will mean that we reestablish our nation's um, international leadership and credibility on nuclear safety and nonproliferation? Yes, and, I, um, and it's come up a couple of times today too. The the, um, the reference to um, the importance of national security. So, you know, if we, as, if we do our job, and uh, you know, we have to be able to work with Congress, with DOE, and, and others to be sure that we are um, uh, again not a barrier. But if we can license and, and allow these technologies to get to market where they can do what they have to do, we're, we, you know, uh, what we're involved in can be exported along with it. And that's our expertise, um, you know, to make sure good. that they're operating safely around the world. Good, good. Thank you, Commissioner. And Chairman um, Hanson, I want to ask you very quickly. I've just got a little bit of time here left. You mentioned in your testimony that the NRC's budget request includes an increase partially for an increase in licensing actions related to accident tolerant fuel. Accident tolerant fuel is, as you know, Southern Company in Georgia has done significant work with this in, in, in testing. Could you provide, um, can you just give us very quickly the status on the accident um, tolerant fuel? Uh, yeah, Congressman, that'll be hard. I could talk about accident tolerant fuel all day, but I, I, I won't. Uh, we are proceeding at pace with a lot of uh, interactions with uh, potential licensees on this subject. There are uh, probably nine different technologies out there. We're working 
with um, both the Department of Energy and uh, our licensees on the results of tests of those technologies. Uh, we've got a project plan that I think prepares us to license these accident talent fuel technologies in the 2023 timeframe. This is a, a personal interest and a personal priority of mine. So um, I think we're, we're moving ahead and I'm paying close attention to this effort. And we appreciate you, you paying close attention because it is extremely important. So thank all of you and thank you for this hearing again today, Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Soto, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Nuclear power is key to help us achieve net carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, that's why President Biden included it in the American Jobs Plan, specifically included funding for development of advanced and small modular nuclear reactors and for a clean electricity standard. The same type of clean electricity standard we're working on in this committee, not saying that there's any type of energy that's prohibited, but making sure that the results lead to us getting further uh, reduced in carbon. Uh, there was a little bit of uh, bickering back and forth in the committee. You'd think that we're not as close as we are, but I, it's really important to, to recognize this is a bipartisan opportunity um, because speaking for the Democrats on the community, I know we support continuing nuclear into the future, and I know we've heard from our Republican colleagues in a passionate way today. Uh, according to the Department of Energy, these advanced reactors envision to vary in size from tens of megawatts uh, to larger can be used for power generation to process heat, desalinization for power generation for other industrial uses. So when you think about everything from resolving water issues in the West through desalinization uh, to helping with smaller units that may be specifically for specific factories and helping with our industrial base, uh, that's really exciting. Uh, the American Jobs Plan calls for $15 billion for research and development priorities, including advanced nuclear and rare earth element recovery technologies, recycling that we've all been talking about today of uh, nuclear materials. So my question for all three of our NRC commissioners, starting with Chairman Hansen, would this $15 billion that's called for in the American Jobs Plan help us expedite development of modular nuclear power? Uh, Congressman, thank you for that. Uh, um, I'm not uh, familiar uh, explicitly with the, um, the terms of the American Jobs Plan. Um, uh, certainly- Would a $15 billion investment help jumpstart this though, generally, even if you weren't familiar? Um, standing outside, even as the safety regulator, it seems like it would, yes. Thanks, and, and Commissioner Barron, your thoughts on it? the investment. Yeah, I agree. I mean, obviously, one of the key challenges to deploying the new technologies is just the financial side of things. So, um, you know, a significant investment like that, I would imagine, would have a, a significant effect. Commissioner Wright, do you believe that a $15 billion investment would help us move along on modular nuclear? Well, uh, uh, intuitively, you would say, yes, it would. I, I think it matters to, to exactly how it's invested and where it comes from. And you know, you've got to also have uh, vendors, <laughs> you know, who are willing to that want to go down that road. So uh, I, I, intuitively, yeah, you probably think it might, but um, I think the devil's in the detail on that. Certainly, and I agree. It's got to be crafted correctly. Also, I see a compromise that could form from this committee. You know, we have existing nuclear power plants that are decommissioning uh, and ones that are recently decommissioned that could be utilized and helping us achieve net carbon neutral, combat climate change. But the reason they're shutting down isn't a great mystery. Uh, it's because right now it's costing about 25 cents per kilowatt hour with nuclear, while ga natural gas is about 6.5 cents per kilowatt hour. So I believe, Chairman, there could be a compromise in providing for subsidies uh, to, excuse me, to nuclear power to make sure that we are keeping these online, keeping them safe as part of our overall uh, effort to combat climate change. Uh, and I think that's something we may be able to get uh, 
other committee members on. The road I don't want us to go down is trying to do a major deregulation of protections of nuclear power. Uh, that is something that will put Americans in danger. So I think the key is to make sure we're putting our money where our mouth is um, by passing the American Jobs Plan, investing in research and development for nuclear advanced power, such as modular, and for the recycling um, that we've talked about so much uh, today. We can do it together. I know there's a bipartisan uh, proposal um, that we'll get to vote on soon, and I hope all of you uh, will be able to support that. And with that, uh, I yield back, Chairman. Yield back. The chair now recognizes the jury from Arizona, Ms. Lesko, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the commissioners for not only being here today, but for all the work that you do. Palo Verde Nuclear uh, Plant is located really close to my congressional district, right outside my congressional district here in Arizona. And it produces the most power of any kind uh, in the nation for the last 25 years. I, I think it's 32 million megawatt hours annually that can power uh, more than 4 million people, energy for more than 4 million people. Um, one of my questions, and I, I guess I'll direct it to uh, Commissioner Hansen is as the number of nuclear operating plants goes down, uh, there's a fee that's assessed to all the uh, operating nuclear plants. And so as the number goes down, are you planning on reducing your overhead budget so that the fees of the ones that are left uh, operating are not going to go up and skyrocket? Congressman, uh, that's a very uh, that's a very good question, and we're very sensitive to the issue of um, shutdown plants. Then um, those costs being spread to a uh, a fewer number of um, of reactors uh, out there in the world, and so we are paying close attention to our overhead costs and trying to be very prudent uh, about where we're spending money, and also trying to make investments for the future. Uh, in things like IT and um, the development of our people so that we can um, focus on advanced reactors. We really are trying to kind of do, uh, kind of pulled in multiple directions, I think, budget-wise here, and we're trying to balance those and not impose uh, undue costs on, on any particular party. So I would say that we are um, uh, sensitive to that issue and recognize also that, you know, there are a, there is a certain level of fixed costs uh, for the work um, uh, that we do. So, you know, we recognize potentially the need to bring down some of those overhead costs as plants, um, as plants go offline, um, but also there's going to be a limit to which we can um, uh, reduce those overhead costs as well. Well, I'm glad you're looking at it because to me it just doesn't seem uh, fair if you have uh, less uh, operating plants, but you don't reduce your budget because to me, it seems like you'd have less people inspecting and that type of thing. Um, and, and I understand how you want to increase your budget in the new technologies, but I don't necessarily know if it's fair to charge the others more. So I'm glad you're looking at it and I'm glad you think it's important. Uh, my next question is, as U.S. works to achieve clean energy commitments, uh, it's clear that the development of intermittent re uh, renewable energy um, uh, is part of it, but it can't be all of the plan. I believe nuclear energy has to be part of the clean uh, future, and that is what most of my Democrat colleagues seem to be agreeing with it. So that's fantastic. I do agree with Mr. Soto. This is something that we can work on in a bipartisan basis. So what is the commission doing to ensure regulatory reviews are timely and there is regulatory certainty regarding new nuclear design, construction and operation? And I'll ask it to you again, Mr. Hansen. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for that. We've talked um, uh, off and on today about the development of a new regulatory framework for advanced reactors. 
um, as part of that development, we really are building on um, the long wealth of history that we have in the NRC of um, regulating nuclear technology and focusing on the most safety significant uh, aspects so that we can provide for our applicants and our licensees timely, efficient, and transparent uh, uh, reviews. As I've said uh, multiple times today, and, I, and I've said it because I really do believe it, I, um, we are independent uh, of, of other policy functions, but we don't want to be an impediment to any decisions that administrations or the private sector wants to make. We want to um, uh, be able to make our, our safety determinations um, uh, uh, in that, in that context, Thank all you. Of my colleagues. And uh, Mr. Hans comment. Mr. Hansen, one last question with 14 seconds left. Um, nuclear waste uh, remains a, a hurdle, a concern uh, for increasing nuclear power. And so there was a blue ribbon uh, commission under both, I think, President Obama and Bush that recommended a separate federal commission deal with the research and development, um, and those type of things on nuclear waste. And I think one of the ideas was moving it over to your commission, the NRC. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, thank you uh, for that, Congresswoman. I wasn't aware of, of that recommendation, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss that with you or other members of Congress uh, should it arrive. Commissioner Barron might have some thoughts on this. Yeah, I think, I think the Blue Ribbon Commission, the separate entity they were contemplating was, was going to be like a government corporation, not NRC, which would still be the safety regulator, but a separate government corporation that would be focused exclusively on, like, siting issues. None of any time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Trader, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, great hearing here today. Uh, just one question, really, for uh, Mr. Hansen. Uh, I understand the administration's uh, requesting a 5% increase in the NRC budget. And just curious how the NRC is going to uh, use that funding to streamline and maybe improve the application process along the lines of some of the previous questions we've had. And uh, is there a way we can uh, uh, reduce the need for applicants to resubmit redundant information uh, on new designs that use a lot of the previously reviewed technical parameters? For example, uh, uh, last August, uh, uh, Nuclear, Regu Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, completed a safety review of new scales design uh, power power reactor design. I understand new scale is going to come in with uh, a new design application that uses a lot of the technical design parameters you've already approved. How does the NRC plan to work with new scale to reduce the uh, the time uh, and make this more efficient yet a very safe process? Um, thank you, Congressman, for that. Uh, my understanding of of new scales uh, kind of. What you, what you called their new application is is really a, a kind of a power increase um, for their existing technology, um, going from I think uh, 50 megawatts uh, per unit to up to 77. And and because we've already um, done, as you noted, an extensive review of the 50 megawatt technology, my understanding from the NRC staff is, is that the the review of kind of the change in operations and and whatever other technical uh, aspects of the technology um, might need to be implemented uh, would be um, uh, really uh, pretty efficient um, and and streamlined. Okay, very good, very good. No, I appreciate that. And I appreciate uh, the tenor of the hearing and the fact you are trying to get things done in a timely manner, a safe manner, but uh, also a very timely manner because uh, the, this process has seemed to take almost forever. So appreciate the commission's attention. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. You, Mac, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Crenshaw, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, everybody, for uh, being here, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, it, it is a great topic. Uh, I, I do see a lot of um, surface consensus on the uh, on the issue of nuclear and, and and the need to build more advanced nuclear in the United States. I, I think is the answer uh, to lowering carbon emissions globally. 
So you know, I just want to lay out a few facts uh, and why nuclear is so important. It's safe, it's reliable, it's carbon-free energy. Uh, more energy can be produced per square foot than, than other carbon-free energies. In fact, solar requires 450 times more land than nuclear and wind. And, or sorry, and wind requires 400 times more land than nuclear when producing the same amount of energy. It's also worth noting that as far as subsidies go, solar receives 250 times more subsidies uh, than nuclear does. And nuclear energy is reliable. It has capacity factors into the 90th percentile. Uh, so really a lot of the, where there is some disagreement is I think it's over the misunderstandings of how safe nuclear is. Um, Commissioner Wright, could you speak to that for, for a minute, please? Do you believe nuclear energy is safe? Why do you believe nuclear energy is so safe? Do you, do you believe that under the current safety framework that an incident like Chernobyl could ever occur in the United States? Uh, well, personally, I, I, yes, I do believe that it's extremely safe or I wouldn't be in the, uh, the business of what I'm doing right now. And, and, uh, and you know, I, I believe that what we... What we've heard today from you know the other colleagues here, uh, and from some of the, the uh, congressmen that, that have spoken, is we are the gold standard, right? We are we are it, um, and uh, we have to do everything we can to maintain that. And and to that end, um, it it you have to be passionate about what you do, and that's what our staff does every day when they come to work, and that's what the licensees at the and their workers at the plants do every day, and that's what the resident inspectors do at the plant every day. They, they're doing everything they can to ensure the safe operation of those plants. Uh, and, if, and you and I both know that a, that a, that a plant that's run safe uh, stays out of, you know, white findings or any other findings that add to the cost and add to the oversight. So, and, and again, they're peer-reviewed by their own people. So uh, that's an additional layer of, of uh, I guess, regulatory uh, oversight. So... Uh, and and you don't want to, from what I understand, you don't want to be the plant that's the on the bottom of the list when you go to those uh, those impo meetings. So, uh, you know, we like to we need to share information. We need to learn from each other, um, not just from the the licensees, but also from the people like impo people that are involved in other uh, aspects of of, of uh, this sector. Um, so yes, I uh, you know I do believe it's safe. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Baron, I, I want to ask about, well, first I want to get your philosophy. I mean, I, I think we would all agree from a policy perspective, from, a, from a, a general national interest perspective, that we should be licensing a lot more reactors and, and, and really trying to get more advanced reactors online. W would you at least, would we agree on that? Well, I agree absolutely that NRC's role is to be ready for that. You know, we, as the chairman right. has mentioned several times, we don't we don't promote nuclear energy, but we've got to be ready for the applications that could come before us. Right. And okay, and that's good. That, that that's good to hear. I want us to be on the same page on that because because I, I I do think that sometimes we say we we say we approve of it, but sometimes regulations get in the way. And I want to refer to your comments on emergency planning zones and then the regulations regarding such emergency planning zones. You've mentioned that small modular reactors need 10 miles of EPZs, just like their light water counterparts. And I understand the need to mitigate risk, but if we're going to be building more reactors, and why would we use more potentially unnecessary land, which means more expenses? and we're not going to end up with more reality. Can, can you comment on that? Sure, yeah. Um, I hope I didn't leave you with the impression that I thought it all had to be exactly the same for new reactors, because I don't believe that. I think uh, new designs could potentially be safer um, than current large water reactor designs, and it makes sense to have a graded approach um, that accounts for potential safety improvements, uh, whether it be in small modular reactors uh, or advanced reactors. Uh, my point is just, I think, uh, with the possible exception of like micro reactors with very small amounts of, of radioactive material, I, I, I don't see completely eliminating off-site emergency planning or, or siting constraints. I think you may have that graded, but going all the way to zero is a different story. And I think it's a, it's a balance to strike there. Okay. Well, that is different from your comments before, so I do appreciate that. You know, I come from the Navy. You know, we've with the nuclear Navy has logged 5,400 reactor years of accident-free operations, traveled over 130 million miles on nuclear energy uh, without accident. And so I, I, I'm glad to hear you kind of change some of your past comments a little bit on that. I'm already out of time. That, that, was, that goes quick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. 
the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Ms. Schreier, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our <coughs> witnesses. I, my first question is about uh, international collaboration. This is for Chairman Hansen. In, in 2019, NRC and the Canadian nuclear regulator, CNSC, signed a memorandum of cooperation to increase collaboration on the technical reviews of advanced reactors, including small module, modular and micro reactors. And Canada has an aggressive advanced reactor licensing and deployment program and is moving forward with the demonstration of a number of advanced small modular reactions, reactors, excuse me, including ultra safe nuclear corporations gas cooled reaction at the Chalk River site. So my question for Chairman Hansen is, does the NRC plan to leverage this cooperative agreement with CNSC and lessons learned from our key international partners, like, like the UK, for example, to share information related to the licensing review process to accelerate deployment of small modular reactors and maximize opportunities for greater efficiencies and streamlining here at home? Uh, Congresswoman, thank you for that uh, question. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about our uh, cooperation um, with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Um, we, as part of that cooperative agreement, I think we have eight or nine areas on different technologies that we're um, uh, evaluating uh, together, recognizing that each country will, do, will make its own uh, safety determination, but we've also really um, seen the value of, um, of some shared reviews and some shared um, understanding of technical tools and, and other kinds of um, uh, methodologies. Um, I, I, uh, I've developed, a, a, I think, a close relationship with um, President Ramina Velshi of the CNSC, and um, and this is a the progress on on the memorandum of cooperation is a is a regular uh, topic of conversation um, uh, between us. As as you note, uh, I agree. I think we can go uh, farther together than we can uh, separately when it comes to some of these new technologies. I agree. It's been really helpful, for example, under COVID, with COVID, to see vaccine development in multiple countries and how we've collaborated in a lot of ways there, even though each country has its own approval process. Are there any other ways that you are um, collaborating with other countries, for example? Yeah, so thank and then you. I have for, another question. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I, as part of our cooperation with the Canadians, we're starting to um, uh, bring in our colleagues in the United Kingdom. Uh, they have a strong interest in this, of course, as you may have heard, they're looking at SMRs as well, and so they're interested in the reviews that we're conducting uh, together right now. The, the UK are observers and the process that's going on between the United States and the Canadians, um, but I would expect um, uh, uh, greater participation in the future as we move forward on that. Great, thank you. My next question is going to be for Commissioner uh, Barron, which is, about timing and whether we can meet some of our deadlines. Because um, again, in contrast to what a lot of my colleagues are saying, we understand that we need a vast portfolio, that nuclear is part of that portfolio, particularly for industry, and it's gotta be part of the solution if we're gonna hit our goals. And so um, you know, what we're seeing is a lot, of, um, a lot of development across the country, Department of Energy's Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program has driven the speed of these new reactors. Like just this year, New Scale Power and Grant County Public Utility District here in Washington signed a memorandum of understanding to explore nuclear energy deployment here in Washington. In addition, Energy Northwest, um, Grant County PUD and X Energy LLC also signed a memorandum of understanding establishing a partnership. And these agreements reaffirm the increasing demand and the, the fact that we're headed that way now we know that the research part is progressing quickly, but then there's this element where as soon as one gets uh, gets approval, um, they have to start operating within seven years. What are the chances we're going to meet those kinds of deadlines? Can we do it? Well, well you're right. I think I, I think that part. Um, the big question there, I think, is what are the plans of the specific companies, yep, right? So, um, you know, if a utility wants to build a, a new reactor, um, they're gonna come to us for licensing. Um, if it's a vendor, they may ask us to certify a design. If it's a utility, they may seek a license to build a, at a specific location. Uh, we're gonna do our licensing review, the safety and environmental piece. Uh, if they get a license, then 
really the, it's up to them to decide whether they want to actually build it. And, and that'll depend on a variety of factors, business factors, the economics of it. We don't make that decision. That's, that's a decision they make. And then, of course, they're the ones who really build it, right? I mean, they, they've got to actually do the construction. And that would be on uh, the time frame they would set up. Our job would be to oversee that construction as we're doing right now for the two reactors being built at Vogel. And you'll have the personnel to do that. I'm out of time. Thank you very much. I yield back. Do they use Mac? The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rush. And I think one of the things that we often get into in these is just rest assured, uh, we don't want deregulation of the, nu the nuclear. And I think when we talk about the regulatory environment, we don't talk enough about, it's not that we want answer or don't want the answers to be no, but oftentimes is how long it takes to say yes. So I want to follow up a little bit on what Congresswoman Lesko said and what Congressman Schrader were talking about. Listen, we don't have nuclear reactors or fuel cycle facilities in North Dakota, but as a matter of policy, it's important to make sure that there is a clear, predictable set of rules for nuclear interviewers. The NRC, she, NRC should be a reliable and predictable regulator, which will help foster innovation. We've heard about multiple times today about what the NRC, NRC is doing to prepare for advanced reactors. And the advanced reactor that is the furthest along is the new scale small modular reactor, which is in the final steps of receiving design approval from the NRCC or NRC. The certification will have taken five years so far and $70 million in upfront licensing. This is equivalent to 10 to 15 years of fees charged by operating facilities. Going forward, it makes no sense to have reviews as time consuming and costly to incremental new technologies like new scale. Chairman Hansen, uh, applicants must have a good understanding of how long and how much money it will cost to get a license at the beginning of the licensing process. And you talked earlier about having a more timely, efficient, and streamlined review, and that we don't want, want the uh, NRC to be an impediment to these progresses. But specifically, how is the NRC putting together workable and predictable project schedules for advanced reactor reviews? I mean, five years is a long time. <laughs> I can't hear. Can anybody hear? No, I, I can't hear. I'm sure this is really smart and I want to hear it. <laughs> Sorry, my, my light is on. Uh, now we hear you. And I, I'm going to we have the chairman now. take my spot and he can answer the question with my mic. I'm sorry, Congressman. I'm gonna I'm gonna sit in Commissioner Barron's seat here for just a second. Um, I, I, <laughs> I I'll have to get back to you on the specific um, uh, for, for the record on the specific mechanisms we use to uh, help licensees. But we do break down each application that we get into the component parts and develop uh, detailed schedules and 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 cost estimates for each of those so that we have transparency for our licensees. And I. Um, I apologize, I don't have the details on that in front of me, but I, I'd be happy to get back to you for the record on exactly how we do that. No, and I appreciate that because, I mean, really, one of the things is we want a reasonable regulatory environment, but it has to have, I mean, we talk about 25 cents a kilowatt hour versus six cents, but, and even in reading in the, in the, the majority memo for this, the economic situations facing nuclear is gas, renewables, and flat energy demand, but we don't factor in other things like how much of that 25 cents is it regulatory, competing against production tax credits, repower provisions, primary primacy on the grid. So, I mean, there are more factors into a lot of this. Um, Chairman, Han I'm gonna ask, just ask this question for everybody quick. The NRC has also provided principles of good regulation, which include requirements for reliable and clear regulatory activity. Do you commit to upholding these requirements and can the committee hold you to them moving forward? Uh, absolutely, Congressman. Uh, they're posted in my office. I look at them and, and read them every day. Thank you. Chair, or Commissioner Barron, I, I, you got to hop, skip mics. I'm sorry about that. 
I was, I was going to have to give the chairman my proxy on that. Yeah, we, okay. you know, there's not a day that goes by that we don't hear about uh, the principles of good regulation and think about them. It's, it's uh, definitely a part of the conversation. It always has been at NRC. Thank you. I hope good and, and timely, Ray. Yeah. Commissioner I, Wright? Yep, I brought a copy with me. I keep them with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Thank you all very much. I yield back. You back now, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Joyce, for five minutes. First, I want to thank you, Chairman Rush, for allowing me to wave on to this joint subcommittee hearing, and I want to thank the commissioners for appearing. It is impossible to understate how important nuclear power is to the future of American energy production. It's the cleanest source that we can produce significant quantities of power around the clock, rain or shine, 365 days a year. In 2019, nuclear power was responsible for 36% of total electricity produced in my home state of Pennsylvania. It supported 4,500 jobs and accounted for 92% of carbon-free electricity in our Commonwealth. If my colleagues are serious about trying to cut down on carbon emissions, nuclear power is clearly a safe and effective solution. And yet nuclear power plants across the country are in danger of closing. In my state, Three Mile Island has already begun the decommissioning process and others are close to following suit. It is imperative that the NRC provides a stable regulatory environment so that our existing fleet of plants can continue to produce safe and clean energy for Americans. My first question is for Chairman Hansen. As you witnessed and mentioned that you recently visited Limerick, Exelon is undertaking a significant digital modification project at this generation station that will set industry precedent for modernizing the existing fleet of plants. By itself, Limerick, the generating station there, has two nuclear reactors that produce more than 2,300 megawatts of zero emission energy, enough carbon-free electricity to power 2 million homes here in Pennsylvania. How does digital modernization contribute to plant safety? And that's a question for you, please, Chairman Hansen. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for that. Uh, I, I think it contributes uh, in, in a number of ways. Um, first of all, it can increase the reliability uh, of, of plant components. Um, it reduces uh, the size and the number of, of components that need to be maintained within the plant, um, particularly on the auxiliary system side. So a lot of the pumps and motors and other kinds of things, it can help provide information on uh, uh, maintenance schedules and uh, conditions um, uh, remotely uh, for plant staff um, so that that information can augment then on-site inspections and other kinds of maintenance activities that plant staff undertake. I think there's a wide range of the kinds of information, and I think we're going to learn a lot over the next few years about the kinds of information that you can get from these systems that could potentially uh, enhance system uh, safety and, and overall operational efficiency of these facilities. Chairman Hansen, recognizing that important information, are DOE or you at NRC doing anything to incentivize nuclear power plants to make the transition to digital? Um, Congressman, I'll note, I think as my colleagues have, it, it's, it's not our role necessarily to incentivize, but I can tell you it's a priority for me to create um, and for the NRC to refine uh, and have a clear regulatory line of sight for the licensing of these technologies. That may, having that regulatory line of sight may create an incentive in and of itself. Thank you for recognizing that. Uh, my next question is for Commissioner Wright. And as the relief picture and on the heels of last night's All-Star Game, Commissioner Wright, you mentioned that you're an umpire outside of the office. And in a lot of ways, your role at the NRC is to be an umpire for the nuclear power industry. As you know from your time on the Diamond, there is nothing worse than an unpredictable strike zone. Amen. What lessons are being implemented to make sure that the licensing renewal process is even more predictable and straightforward while still ensuring safety and thus allow nuclear power to play its best game 
for all of the American people. I like the analogy. Thanks. That's really good. Very good job. Thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, our job is to really to call the balls and strikes, but we have to do it within what our mission is, and that's the reasonable assurance. It's no more and it's no less. Um, and, you know, although it's not defined, you know, just like everybody's strike zone is different, um, it's still over the plate in that same general area. So we've got to be sure that we are doing everything that we can at every level. I mean, from the, the resident. And just aspect. allow me to interrupt. So is, is that meaning that the licensing renewal process can be even more predictable and more straightforward? I, I believe so, yes. We have to provide, uh, you know, regulatory certainty for uh, whoever comes before us and a pathway to do what they need to do. If it's in the uh, um, advanced reactor space, we're not going, and each of my colleagues have said it as well, it is not our desire to be an impediment to innovati innovation or innovators. Thank you. My time has expired and I yield. I think Chairman Rush, you're still muted. That concludes uh, the witness questions. And I certainly want to thank uh, Chairman Hansen, uh, Commissioner Marin, and Commissioner Wright for your excellent testimony. This has been a great uh, informative uh, and necessary hearing, and I want to thank you all for joining us today, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and um, the commissioners. Uh, <clears throat> I remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witness, witnesses who have appeared before us today. And I also ask each witness to respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. Uh, without objection, uh, the subcommittee is hereby adjourned. <laughs>